Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm in the ducks line on Sunday. Good morning. <laughs> the room's filling up more and more. Go. Good things happening. <laughs> well, no, no, I didn't. Know what it was. And for the, about no, the next, yeah, how we have, 75 years. Next week, we will be organized for the committee members. Uh, yeah, we'll have five hearings yeah, next week. <laughs> More to come, yes. Uh, the beginning of uh, full schedules even more. In the meantime, really appreciate everyone participating, our panelists for being here to have an important conversation uh, today around fentanyl. Uh, and we organize these roundtables and appreciate those who've traveled uh, because we're not, we're not officially organized under the 118th Congress, uh, but we are anxious to get to work. So before we get started, please be aware that all the microphones are turned on and side conversations may be picked up on the live stream. Okay. Uh, to help our tech team, I'm going to count down from five to give them the heads up on the live stream. Five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Committee on Energy and Commerce's Roundtable discussing uh, the examination of big tech's role in the ongoing fentanyl crisis affecting Americans across the country. The age of the internet has provided us with great benefits. It's allowed us to remain close to family and friends, even though we may be miles apart. It provides us an opportunity to obtain essential goods and services more conveniently, especially for seniors and those living with disabilities and we can access valuable information on demand. While an incredible tool, this level of access has created an environment where bad actors can take advantage of vulnerable citizens online. And this exploded during the pandemic. We're here today because we've all heard from constituents about the dangers that they and their children face online. In many instances, big tech companies have failed be good stewards on their platforms. We've seen numerous reports detailing how big tech encourages addictive behaviors in our children to keep them glued to their screens and fails to protect their users from malicious actors on their platforms like drug dealers, targeting vulnerable populations with counterfeit drugs laced with fentanyl and fentanyl-related substances. Every day, more Americans die from illicit fentanyl poisoning an estimated 200 a day. Today, children are dying from fentanyl poisoning. These deaths can be prevented. They must be prevented. Last year, the Energy and Commerce Republicans sent letters to the CEOs of certain big tech companies calling on them to do their part to protect children from fentanyl poisoning. While we recognize that many social media platforms have engaged in education campaigns to combat the use of legal drugs, it's not enough. We must take an all-hands-on-deck approach to preventing the sale and transfer of these illegal drugs on these platforms to prevent one more child from dying. Today, I'm thankful that we have a group of panelists who can help us understand the challenges of attacking the fentanyl crisis, and we hope to be able to discuss difficulties in holding these drug dealers accountable, and what more social media can do on their own and in collaboration with law enforcement to create a safer experience for the users on their platforms. Today, we'll hear from Spokane County Sheriff, Sheriff John Knowles, uh, who's working every day to protect Americans from harm, including drug dealers on social media. And I just uh, appreciate you traveling from Spokane, Washington to join us and all your work to keep uh, people in Eastern Washington safe. I wanna thank uh, Amy Navil for sharing your story, Amy, uh, with us today. As a mom, I cannot imagine the pain of losing a child, and I just appreciate your bravery, your leadership in being here and speaking for so many others and making a difference. 
Carrie Goldberg, who testified before the committee last year on Section 230 reform, and she's going to provide important insights in holding big tech accountable. And Laura Marquez Garrett, with Social Media Victims Law Center, who can share her experience working on behalf of victims who have been subjected to fentanyl poisoning after purchasing a pill online. These are not easy conversations to have, but they are necessary to raise awareness and end preventable deaths of our fellow Americans and our children. We have a great opportunity to address these issues this Congress, and I look forward to working with all of you. I wanna thank our participants for taking time out of your busy schedules to travel to Washington, D.C. for sharing your stories, your expertise. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and provide some opening remarks. And then we're good. we have a whole bunch of members here that want to engage and ask some questions too. So with that, we're going to start with, I'm going to start with uh, Amy. Amy Neville, thank you. The members of this committee. Maybe you got to press a button. Oh, looky there. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all on this committee for having me today. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that I can share my experience and knowledge with you, with you but I, I sure wish it was under different circumstances. All right, so now, now for the hard part. Uh, one sunny day in June of 2020, I was preparing to take my 14-year-old son, Alexander, to the orthodontist. I went to his room to wake him, and there he laid, looking like he was just asleep on his beanbag chair except he wasn't sleeping, Alex was dead. His father tried CPR, the paramedics tried naloxone, but it was too late. Alex had taken a pill he believed to be Oxycontin. Turned out that it was a counterfeit pill made with fentanyl. That fake pill had enough fentanyl in it to kill four people. We only had him 14 years. That amazing child who could do anything that he said his mind to was gone. Prior to his end, Alex was a skateboarder. He scouted and he experimented. Alex was curious about everything and would master subjects. At points in his life, he was an Egyptologist, a Civil War historian, historian a Pokemon encyclopedia, and so many more things. By the time we learned Alex had been using cannabis, he had also mastered Snapchat. Through this app, Alex is able to overcome the natural limits that kept, keep most kids from trying the hardest drugs. The natural limits that exist for his generation and others include a supportive family, a good school, a strong community, and other safeguards that we knew to provide. Follow the plan and it will all work out. Social media, however, transcends these natural limits. With Snapchat, Alex's normal circle of friends expanded further and began intersecting with abnormal circles. It was on Snapchat that Alex was able to visit with dealers and other users. It was on Snapchat that he set up a deal to get pills. It was on Snapchat that he made plans to have the dealer drive up to our house that Al and so Alex could sneak out for a couple of minutes one night and get anything he wanted. On Snapchat, messages are truly ephemeral and are deleted as soon as they are viewed. Taboo speech, backstabbing, narcissism, anything can all be conveyed through the app with little concern for consequences because the history vanishes after it's read. Drug dealers, child abusers, and other criminal users appreciate these privacy features too. For them, Snapchat is a portal to other markets that were previously inaccessible and they readily take advantage. Snap and other social media companies are free of liability for this behavior on their platform because our laws were written to protect them. The only part Snap has ever been accountable for is to answer to law enforcement subpoenas. Yet according to interviews with police that we did for our best practices to combat drug trafficking on social media, sheriffs, federal agents, and many times, many, say that many times Snap is very slow to respond to court orders if they respond at all. After meeting with parents of dead users, Snap posted public safety announcements on their platform with minimal efficacy. More importantly, through a work a network of lobbyist lawyers and a $100 billion portfolio, SNAP has assembled a well-oiled lobbying machine to avoid any public policy changes that might assign some responsibility for the deaths that their platform facilitates. To paraphrase Francis, 
To, par to paraphrase Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen, for companies like Snap, lobbying and litigation are simply the cost of doing business. As of today, this here, this is the current map of known deaths where dealers, where drug dealers using Snapchat has killed a customer with a fake pill. This includes all counterfeit pills, with the majority being fentanyl. Again, this is just for the deaths attributed to pills and Snapchat. And this is, uh, all of these states have multiple deaths. And the ones that are not, or that are still blue, it's just a matter of time. It's just going through the verification process and connecting with law enforcement before we can actually fill those in. I thank Partnership for Safe Medicines for doing such good work on this. Um, it does not include, this map does not include the millions who survive and the tens of thousands more who will die before the year is out. So I ask you, if an airplane company killed this many people in just a few years, would their planes be flying today? Or would we have grounded them until we were sure they were safe? If a car company's vehicles killed drivers and passengers in this many states, would there not be a call for legal and financial accountability? An investigation that resulted in changes in business practices? We wouldn't ban planes and cars forever, but we'd make sure we, before we put people back in them that they were fixed. We are at an inflection point with Snapchat. Something has to be done. Congress can force them to accept responsibility and do better. And I have some ideas about that, and I hope that at some point in this Congress we can talk about these things. Thank you. Good morning, <laughs> Madam Chair Rogers and each member of this committee. My name is Carrie Goldberg, and I founded the law firm C.A. Goldberg PLLC nine years ago to represent victims of catastrophic injuries from all over the country, by, well, by now well over 1,100, every age, gender, race, religion, and all of their injuries stem from internet companies. On December 1st of 2021, I was here testifying to this very same subcommittee under different leadership about the enormous hurdles in holding tech companies liable for harming their users. The main hurdle, of course, being Section 230. In that hearing 14 months ago, I told the subcommittee that over the past six months, I'd been meeting with seven families, each whose child was killed because they purchased one fentanyl laced pill on Snapchat. I'm now going on two years of working with these families as they fight to prevent other families from suffering the same tragedy. Today's event is, is the round table on big tech and, and fentanyl poisoning crisis. But what you're going to hear today is that almost all fentanyl poisonings have three things in common. Number one, the purchaser was a teenager. Number two, they had no intention of buying fentanyl, but thought that they were purchasing something recreational. And number three, the transaction occurred through the online platform Snapchat. <clears throat> Big Tech has many problems, but the lethal fentanyl sales is not a general Big Tech problem. It's a Snap-specific problem. Snap's product is designed specifically to attract both children and illicit adult activity. In the almost two years that we've been working with this, these families, we fought for Snap to change its product to address the features that make it so attractive to dealers and kids alike, and that make sport of evading parental oversight. Instead, though, they've let the body count increase, with almost 20% of all fentanyl deaths we know about occurred on Snapchat in the last 14 months since I was here testifying. In October of 2022, we filed the first lawsuit in the country against Snap, saying it was an unreasonably dangerous and defective product for the design features that make Snap the one and only hunting ground for lethal fentanyl overdoses. We are suing on behalf of nine families, eight of whom laid a child to rest, including Amy Neville here, a tireless advocate and the mother of Alexander Neville, who was forever 14. And we brought on the Social Media Victims Law Center to co-counsel with us, who are here today. We've studied the features that make, Snap so, that make Snap's design so rife for dangerous drug deals. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. 
Number one, Snap's foundational product feature is disappearing messages, which draws in both minors interested in evading parental oversight, as well as drug dealers interested in dealing to vulnerable minors without detection. Number two, Snap is the only social media product that markets to children while also encouraging anonymity. Snap's geolocating feature makes child users findable to dealers passing through their locality. It's called Snap Maps. This self-destructing texts, the expiring posts, and the secure data vault enable dealers to, tr to complete transactions without a trace. Snap's hashing feature makes it easy for users interested in buying drugs to match with users seeking to sell it. The quick add feature recommends children to adult users through an unknown algorithm and, and Snap points incentivize those children to add these strangers. The Snap's most dangerous aspect is its youthful membership. Snap is widely accepted as having cornered the market on teen and tween engagement. It's the only app that's aimed at children where parents cannot see the content. Yet Snap still wants parents to be responsible for what their kids do on it. Snap's permanently auto-deleting content evades police warrants, and it's negligent content moderation protects dealers' accounts even after Snap learns that these people have killed other users. Snap has a veneer as being safe and fun for kids. With its funny filters, it's usually among the first apps installed on a child's first iPhone. Within families, it's seen as safe and familiar and trustworthy. Then with its streaks, which reward daily use, and its snap points, which rewards the eyeballs on the screen, snap becomes addictive. Even with this lawsuit, nothing has changed. We're aware of three more fentanyl, fentanyl deaths since filing it that all happened on snap. But we really can't have a, a conversation about snap's product features, which have basically built a patchwork drug cartel without talking about why it's this way. And as always, Section 230 disincentivizes the adoption of safety features on big tech platforms. The hubris of not believing that they're ever going to be held liable stops companies like Snap from adopting safety measures to keep people safer. They also never have to go through the discovery process in court. As a result, Snap can make all sorts of false claims about its data collection, the extent to which its data collection of children informs recommendations, algorithms, and it can just keep on creating the propaganda that it's a neutral tool. With this case, our clients are taking their chances to hold Snap liable as a defective product and hold Snap responsible for running one of the biggest drug cartels in the world, profiting richly from it. The time allotted to me right now doesn't allow um, for the full details of how common sense reform we need is, but I'm going to bullet point it quickly right now. We must stop protecting platforms that provide material support to interstate drug dealing of counterfeit pills. We must stop protecting platforms that knowingly violate criminal laws by allowing interstate drug dealing of counterfeit pills. We must require that the highest executives account for the activities on their platforms that have enabled kids to buy fentanyl-laced drugs and die. Those executives need to come in and testify. And we need statutes that establish youth privacy and design protections. And of course, Section 230 carve-outs for wrongful death. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Laura. All right, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Thank you for shedding light on these very important and very difficult issues. My name is Laura Marquez Garrett. I'm a Washington State attorney. And last year, I walked away from partnership at one of Seattle's most prestigious law firms to join SMVLC, Social Media Victims Law Center. And that decision was motivated by the fact that first and foremost, I'm the mother of four young children. And I'm afraid for them. I'm afraid for the very real harms they will suffer at the hands of social media companies if something doesn't change. 
Now, currently, SMVLC represents over 1,000 families. These are parents whose children have suffered severe mental health harms, exploitation, even death, arising from social media use. But I'm not here today to talk about the wide range of harms these companies are causing to American youth, just one harm. And that's the role of social media in the fentanyl poisoning crisis. Now, in October of 2022, SMVLC, with our co-counsel, C.A. Goldberg, filed our first fentanyl complaint on behalf of nine families. We now represent more than 47 families whose children have been harmed or have died because of social media, sorry, because of fentanyl poisoning. Um, 43 of those 47 children are dead. Almost half of those children were under the age of 18, as young as the age of 13, and in every one of the instances where these children were connected to a drug dealer by a social media app, one app was used, Snapchat. So I'm here today to tell the committee that the death of American children by fentanyl poisoning is not a social media issue. It's a Snapchat issue. Now, I provided some documents the other day to help assist with this. I'd like to go through those briefly. Uh, the first provides some background on the fentanyl crisis. What makes this crisis different is that for the first time in our nation's history, children, teens, and young adults are dying at the same, if not greater, rates than their adult counterparts. We must ask ourselves, and we must ask Snapchat, how and why these drug dealers <clears throat> have virtually unfettered access to our children in the first place. The second document are some SMBLC case statistics for fentanyl-related harms. The third is a document called Snap Nose. Thank you as well as some examples of Snapchat drug menus. That's much better. Um, this document describes just some of the unique Snapchat features that make the product particularly dangerous to children. Uh, the fourth are photos of just 25 of the children who have died from fentanyl poisoning in connection with the Snapchat app. I also provided a larger fact section document which provides background. That document contains excerpts from police reports and testimonials from parents that refute the representation Snapchat has been making to this committee and to the American public for years. Snap knows. Snap knows that this is a Snapchat issue. It knows that it could make meaningful changes to its product to help keep our children safe. Instead, it has opted for empty promises and children are continuing to die as a result. And I'll provide a few examples. Snap says that it is investing in content moderation except that SNAP also says it has no legal obligation to moderate content. That's Section 230 argument. SNAP says it is taking steps to block search results for drug-related terms. But many of these children were not searching for drug-related terms. They were being connected to dealers and exposed to drug advertising content by the SNAP product and designs. SNAP says it is improving law enforcement support. But the speed at which SNAP responds to subpoenas, when SNAP responds to subpoenas, is not the number one hurdle for the men and women of law enforcement. The number one hurdle is that SNAP is deleting or not preserving data that is critical to their efforts to put these dealers behind bars. SNAP says it is working on technology to help identify and take down dealer accounts. We believe that technology already exists and has existed for some time but also SNAP does not even provide effective in-app reporting tools for users and parents, and it does not take down known dealer accounts. Again, the facts section we provided uh, provides several examples of this. To be clear, SMVLC does not condone the sale or purchase of illegal drugs. We do, however, recognize that children make mistakes. None of these children deserve to die because of one mistake. Now, I'd like to update our second document really briefly. This was the SMVLC statistics document. This was prepared last Friday. This shows that SMVLC is working with 47 families on these issues. As of yesterday morning, less than two business days after preparing this document, that number has gone up to 50. Monday morning, as I was preparing these statements, I received a call from a mother in Kansas. Her son died of fentanyl poisoning after ingesting a single pill purchased through the Snapchat app, a counterfeit pill. Today is Jason's birthday. He would and should have turned 23 today. Instead, he will be forever 21. 
We receive calls like this almost every single day. That is how prevalent this issue is. Madam Chair, members of the committee, we need your help. Our children need your help. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Rogers, committee, thank you for inviting me here today. It is my honor <coughs> to address you and to talk to you about the significant threat that fentanyl is posing to all of the communities in this country. I can tell you a little bit about specific data from Spokane County, and, and I assure you there is similar data that you would have in your own jurisdictions that you represent in the cities and towns and the communities um, that you represent here. From 2017 to 2021, the, the Spokane Field Office for the Drug Enforcement Agency reported a 1,098% increase in fentanyl seizures. During the same time period in Spokane County, we saw a 1,233% increase in fentanyl overdose deaths. Between 2020 and 2021, Spokane County saw a 186% increase in fentanyl-related deaths, and we expect at least another 100% increase in 2022. Is, the data is not final yet, but that's what we anticipate. I have been the uh, commander of our Regional Safe Streets Task Force, a, a federal task force, FBI task force in Spokane for the last seven years. I can tell you that all of the people that we arrest for distributing mid to upper level narcotics quantities, all are dealing fentanyl. They may be dealing other drugs primarily, whether it be methamphetamine or cocaine or things like that, but they all distribute fentanyl as well. We are also finding that fentanyl is laced into almost all drugs that are being sold illicitly on the street. I recently had a conversation with uh, a service provider with one of our homeless populations in Spokane. And I was advised that many of the homeless in Spokane will tell the service providers what their drug of choice is. And it doesn't matter what their drug of choice is stated to be, their blood work still tests positive for fentanyl. It is in every drug that is being distributed in our country we have a significant problem. And as these, these uh, previous witnesses have testified to you, social media and electronic communication are a significant tool that our drug traffickers are using to impact our communities negatively. I will tell you that we have had to make significant investment in law enforcement to keep up with technology. I represent a community of about 560,000 people in the state of Washington. I have about 257 commissioned officers. I have to employ seven full-time investigative analysts with technical expertise and invest over $150,000 a year in equipment and in software to deal with gaining, excuse me, accessing, discovering, evidence in social media. I spend almost $1 million annually to be able to keep up with technology to provide law enforcement services to the victims of crime in Spokane County. Specifically, people who investigate controlled substance homicides, where as these ladies have so eloquently stated, um, is very much driven on social media. The evidence we have to recover is contained in these social media accounts like Snapchat and in other communication platforms such as WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, and the like. We are finding as time goes on that there are more and more online ways to communicate and distribute drugs than we can even keep up with frequently when we make arrests of a drug tra trafficking organization we find that they've been using a communication platform that previous to that we had no idea what it was. The challenge we receive or the challenge we have in law enforcement is threefold where it is, uh, where it comes to technology companies. 
there is a complete lack of retention of data and there is nothing that obligates them to retain data. There are no laws that require these companies to be responsive to legal process within a timely manner. True, some companies do provide data when they have it, but it is not consistent and it is not mandated. Law enforcement needs help with that. We also have a huge issue with encryption, end-to-end -end encryption between users, where even if the, the big data company, the big tech company has the data stored, no one has the encryption keys to make the data usable. It leaves a huge hole in our ability to, to gain evidence and hold evidence and hold people accountable. We need help to combat this. Our drug dealers are all too often allowed to operate in secrecy and there is nothing that even the federal government and federal law enforcement can do about it. This is a significant issue in every community in this country. We need help to hold people accountable who are poisoning our children, poisoning people who are using illicit drugs and they know how dangerous fentanyl is. It is a homicide, it is murder to be delivering these substances knowingly. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. And again, everyone, thank you for, for sharing, testifying today. Thank you for the work that you are doing to protect kids and others from fentanyl, fentanyl poisoning specifically. Amy, I just, as a mom, can't imagine what you've been through. Really. Really appreciate you being here, uh, the courage that you're displaying to share your own story, but also to advocate for so many others. I'd like to start by asking you, uh, you know, I'm a mom, I have a 15-year-old son, and I have uh, two daughters. Uh, just how would you advise other parent, parents to protect their kids from the harms they may encounter on social media, and what, what can parents be doing specifically? It, it, that answer kind of varies family by family, right? Every family has their own set of unique circumstances, but the short answer is really get their passwords, spot check their social media. I mean, these are things that we did in our own home and we're still here in this mess. You know, our internet went off at a certain time. We were following all the rules and things that we're being advised to, but more importantly, parents need to drop whatever stigma they have of what they, who they think this type of happens to, or you know, the not my kid mentality, because that is an incredibly dangerous way to think, because you know what? It is not your kid until it is your kid. And so we need to, to do away with that thinking and look at how could this actually happen in our household? What steps can we take to prevent that? And some of those things include uh, third-party apps that do track any dangerous activity that might be going on on your child's phone. But to that end, Snapchat doesn't allow those to work with their platform. So again, when it comes to Snapchat, it's not going to help you. Uh, Snapchat does have their own parental uh, controls, which uh, Parent Center, which I recommend if, if your kid is on Snap and there's no way to avoid that, to definitely go on that and, and implement those tools. However, that requires you to create an account, increasing more usership on Snapchat. And then you still don't get to see what your kid is talking about. And they equate that to, well, you know, you don't go in the back bedroom when a friend comes over into their bedroom and listen to what they're talking about. Maybe not, but you know what? When a friend comes over, I can vet that kid. I get to talk to that kid in person. I have that opportunity to meet their parents. And when they do go into the child's bedroom, they still have Snapchat. So it really doesn't ultimately change anything. Those harms are still prevalent. You can't see what they're doing. So really have that open conversation. Um, and then overall, if your kid is not on social media yet, uh, you know, wait until at least eighth grade. Wait until eighth to get that get that in their hands because they are going through puberty. Things are happening so fast in their bodies and these social media apps, these spending the time on online platforms is damaging to that frontal lobe and creates a whole other world of problems. So that's the short answer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, like every, every American family, we're battling the screens in our, our, our house every day and it just it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a fair fight. Um, Sheriff. Spokane, Spokane, I, I also represent Spokane. It's long been known as a, just a big, small town, great place to live, great place to raise a family. 
it just uh, is a bit terrifying to hear what's happening in Spokane, as well as all across the country. So I, I'd like just to ask you to speak a little bit more about the barriers that you are facing as sheriff when it comes to trying to work with big tech on these fentanyl cases. Thank you. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the larger challenges that we run into, um, and again, we, we are very well positioned in Spokane County uh, because of some investments we've made in personnel and the expertise to actually, um, you know, write search warrants, write preservation letters to social media companies. Um, that's the moment that we know we need um, or that there might be evidence on some of these platforms. Um, but even then, um, some, some providers, um, and I will say, you know, like, like Telegram, like Signal, like <coughs> WhatsApp, they pride themselves on the fact that they are not storing data. That's how they advertise themselves to users is we're not going to store the data, and if police come looking for it, we will not provide the data. And frequently, we are told when we serve processes to, to these providers is the information is stored on servers that is not in the United States. Therefore, your subpoena, your warrant um, has no standing. There is no jurisdiction and we can't comply. Um, and we've, we've had responses for, um, well, the servers in the Emirates, the servers in Australia, um, and these companies are doing business intentionally that way to prevent law enforcement from being able to recover evidence that is critical to some of these cases. And, and make no mistake, it's not just drug dealing that this is prevalent in. Because we use electronic data so much, it is a part of every investigation that we have, whether it's homicides, child sexual assault, abuse, all of those cases rely heavily on technology. That's why we've had to invest what we have. Devices are fully encrypted now. I know companies like <clears throat> Apple, where we might used to be able to not recover information off of a device, we used to be able to write a warrant and get information from the backup cloud. But it is my understanding that they are going to encrypt the backup cloud here shortly, and we will not even be able to get it from there. We fully uh, search, oh, I apologize. I'll let you talk some more. There's gonna be lots of questions. <laughs> I apologize. Lots of questions. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. Uh, we're gonna get to member questions, get this discussion going further with uh, next from uh, Texas, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Chairwoman. If I might, let me just let you continue your thought then. Um, well, now I, I may have lost it. So, okay. um, well, then, then let me, uh, well, so the, the, the encryption of the iCloud and the encryption of the backup, what I will say is as we search more than 200 cell phones a year with warrants, we fully cannot access 50% of them. About 20% of them, we have to use software such as Gray Key to break the encryption on the phones. Uh, the other 30% we're able to access. So there is a tremendous amount of evidence on phones and in social media accounts that we can't access as good as we are at it. And we have more resources than, than most agencies. Well, one of the things you said, and, uh, and thank you all for being here, and, and thanks for this uh, this roundtable. We've done a lot of work on this over, over the years, and it is frustrating that things are always seem to be one step ahead of us. And we've talked a lot about the analogs. I know that Mr. Latta has, has worked hard on, on trying to schedule fentanyl analogs. But you actually talked about new platforms that are arising rapidly. Is that, and that's the first time I've heard of that. Is that is that one of the things you've encountered? Yeah, I was I was actually just informed uh, this morning that a drug trafficking organization that we have uh, run prior investigations on and thought we knew how they were communicating with each other um, were found to be communicating on a new uh, new electronic platform that we had no idea existed. And and I I don't even know that I could repeat the name of it to you here now because it was one I had never heard of before. And then would these new platforms, then would they fall under Section 230 <clears throat> protection? Let me ask our lawyers that are here. If it's a platform um, that 
engages in the publication of user-to-user -user content, then I can assure you if it's doing something bad and a lawyer tries to hold them accountable, the first thing they're going to do is, is say that they're immune from liability. Well, Sheriff, let me just ask you this, because, <clears throat> and I don't have a background in law enforcement. Um, I do have a background in healthcare. There, there are frequently in law enforcement, you will do stings. You will, I mean, I won't say entice people to do things, but you can capture information real time by someone posing as someone else on a Snapchat platform. Is that, is that not correct? Uh, that is correct. In the instances where we have an informant, um, yes, and the informant, if, you know, a cooperating source, um, you know, they can take screenshots, they can give us access to their phones and, and things like that. But even on some of those platforms, it's even temporary to them and that device. So unless we have that overt cooperation, we run into complications. <clears throat> when we start talking about running uh, investigations into drug trafficking organizations, um, historically, um, you know, back when I was working in narcotics, you know, we did, uh, you know, wire cases, Title sure. III cases, where we could actually real time listen to phone calls being yes. made from the suspect mm -hmm. to other suspects that we didn't know. Well, the problem with using some of these online platforms is, is we can't get real time monitoring and we can't get identification of, you know, it, if they're talking to our source of information, yes. we can get it but we used to be able to see the other people they were making phone calls to or, and hear it, but we can't get that anymore. But then do you get cooperation from, say, your federal partners at DEA or FBI where you can network a number of these nodes and, and try, to, try to build the case or, or collect the data on, on, on where it's happening? I mean, look, if, this were, if these were random shooters in malls, we'd, we'd invoke everything that we had at our at our disposal. So I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, do you get the cooperation from DEA and FBI as far as assembling the data? If you c capture it on a screenshot as an individual who's Snapchatting or Telegramming with someone, do you get the, uh, are you able to access the federal, the federal law enforcement networks? Yes, we, we actually uh, are an embedded task force with both the FBI and we work very closely with the DEA, but the reality of it is, is the DEA and the FBI, they don't have access to that information either. So the very famous case from San Bernardino, California, a few years back was having to, de to unencrypt the, the phone that they finally got from the people that were responsible for a mass crime. Is, were there any, did you, did law enforcement, were, were they able to establish any parameters where that de-encryption could take place? No, no, sir. Um, in fact, right now, we, uh, I, I just actually have to pay a, an annual fee to a company called Gray Key um, that has been moderately successful at breaking the encryption on those phones. Um, and again, that's about our 50% success rate. All right, I see my time's expired. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, to your, your participation today. Oh, and let me just ask one general question. Uh, does your one reference some, uh, or, or Ms. Garrett, I guess you had some, some documents, some data. I would just ask committee staff if they could share that with us because that seemed like that was pretty important stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the gentleman's time's expired and I uh, will ask my line of questions right now. First, I wanna thank our witnesses for being here. And unfortunately, you know, this is a testimony we've heard before and it's not getting any better. And uh, you know, we, as a committee, we wanna make sure that we are making things better. And uh, so that's why it's so important for your testimony today, and we appreciate it. And it's uh, very difficult for you to be here. So, you know, we need to hear your testimony. The people have to hear your testimony. Uh, Sheriff, I can start with you. Um, in, in another life, when I was in the Ohio legislature, I chaired judiciary committees. And the thing that worries me is when I hear that there's nothing we can do. And what we, because again, uh, that's what we're here for. We're here to try to get something done. But you know, just some of the points you brought up about discovering, uh, discovering on evidence and social media, the equipment upgrades that you have to do as a sheriff, the, the non-retaining of that data, being responsive to the legal process, the encryption. But you know, coming right back to that, that uh, overall statement that you made, and I put three stars by it, nothing federal drug enforcement can do. But you, you added this though, you're calling it homicide 
and calling it murder. To me, and in another life, there's something that we have to do. So how, you know, if, if you had that uh, magic uh, crystal ball right now and you looked into it in the future, how are we going to fix it? Well, um, especially when we're talking about murder. It is. Um, we have to do something about the flow of illicit fentanyl into this country. Um, it is, I think it's a well-established fact that, that most of the fentanyl that we see in the United States is coming from China through the Mexican cartels and, and brought in that way. We are not doing enough to stop the flow of fentanyl into our country. Um, and as unpopular as this might be politically, um, I am willing to say that we are facing such a threat and that most American families are being touched by fentanyl in some way, very negatively, that I think we should revisit harsher punishments for people who are distributing fentanyl in the United States. Some reason for the last five years, it has become more and more fashionable um, in some circles to be understanding of people who are distributing drugs. Now, I firmly believe that we need to do everything we can to help people who are addicted. We are sorely lacking in resources for people who are addicted in this country, particularly to fentanyl. However, I have no compassion for people who knowingly distribute fentanyl, knowing how lethal it is, knowing how it destroys lives of those that it doesn't kill. We have to be serious and make significant penalties for people who will distribute these drugs in our communities. Well, thank you. And, uh... Uh, Mr. Griffith uh, from uh, Virginia and I have the uh, halt fentanyl legislation to make it, a, uh, you know, permanently make fentanyl a Schedule One, and so it's important that we get there. Uh, if I could ask uh, uh, Ms. Goberg uh, a question, uh, you know, when you look at the, you wrote down about the uh, Snapchat uh, reaction, uh, you know, what what are you finding when, when you talk to them? on this because again you know it's happening on their platform and it's been called murder and so what, what you know when you when you talk about uh, a felony one or in ohio you know you're talking about uh, aggravated murder what, what are we talking what, what's the reaction um the reaction is one of hubris they don't feel that they can be held liable um they blame the parents <laughs> they um okay let's back up for a second okay how do they blame the parents it's on their platform. Right. Well, they, um, it doesn't make sense to me because the product doesn't let parents see what their kids are doing. But this is just, it's actually a refrain that, they're, that their lawyers use, is, is that this isn't our fault. We're just a, a neutral intermediary. Kids are going to be m making mistakes. It's the cost of doing business. And, and really, it's on the parents to to um, be in charge. That's actually a very classist sentiment because it's not as though parents can, can be looking over, even in the best of circumstances, be looking over the phones and the shoulders of every single one of their children at all times. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired. And our next uh, member to ask questions is the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me over here on the, on the end, and, and I appreciate, Ms. Neville, you being here, and I have a question in a couple of minutes for you. But first, um, to the sheriff, is any platform getting it right? Is there somebody out there we should look at, and if you have issues with, I guess if you're getting right, if they're getting it right, the people aren't using them. But are there some models that we could have to, to say this is the standard? Well, I, I will say that uh, generally, Facebook is very responsive to um, our court processes, things like that. Now, that doesn't mean that, that they're perfect, but um, it's better than a lot. Um, Instagram as well. Um, what we do find, though, is the people who are using these platforms for illicit purposes, as soon as they realize that these platforms are cooperating with law enforcement, they will jump to a different platform. Um, you know, they learn. 
they're, they're business people. They understand what they have to do to stay in business. So um, again, you'll see where, you know, they may have an account on Snapchat, on Facebook, on Instagram, but they won't conduct their illicit activity there. They'll point people to their account on some of those other platforms. Um, so it, it, it's short-lived when they find out that uh, these platforms are cooperating with law enforcement, they will go somewhere else. Thanks, and, and uh, that kind of leads me to my next question. Ms. Goberg and Ms. Marquez Garrett from the legal side, one of you, I can't remember which, it's hard to kind of hear over here in the corner, but talked about executives and legal responsibility. So, you know, it's clear to me, there seems to be clear that there's executives with, with, with platforms that are purely running uh, criminal enterprises and allowing them to happen. The executives may not be, but allowing them to happen. And then you got, I guess what you just said with Facebook and others where they're trying to do it right. The question always in the law when we have to define it is, is usually not that clear. I mean, it's clear who needs to go to jail. It's clear who's trying to do it right. Sometimes it, it moves forward. And so how, how would you define, I think it might have been you, Ms. Goldberg, but both of you, if you're going to hold the executive executives accountable who are running the, the platform, how do, where do you know when they go from um, running a platform that people are taking advantage of into negligence? And, and what, how would you kind of define that out? So there are platforms that are just in the business of doing malicious activity, like sanctioned suicide. That's just in the business of guiding people to suicide. But then there's, there are, are social media platforms um, that, like, like Snap, where they know about a frequent, consistent, and known problem that's just reoccurring. Mm -hmm. And, and it, when it's an illegal one, uh, then, we have, to, we have to say that they have a heightened responsibility to, to fix it. Um, these are the most well-resourced companies in our country. Mm -hmm. They have billions of dollars. They have the most sophisticated technology talent working for them. They can solve these problems if they want to. And I think that's why it's so important to, to put this on on the executive's radar, mm -hmm. because nobody feels the pain. No single person ever feels responsibility mm -hmm. um, for these problems, because there are so there, the teams that work on every single problem are so massive. Yeah, I agree with you. And instead of Ms. Marcus Garrett, maybe I want to go to Ms. Neville, but I agree with you. We've got to. There's there's some that clearly are are, are abusing the system. Always in law is how you define where it, where it crosses over. And that's what we have to, to get right. But you want to? I want to give Ms. Neville a few um, minutes. Yes. Or so, so, so I would just add, you know, in, in our in our legal system, there are also certain corporate protections. Mm -hmm. um, and when you couple that with 230, you have individuals who who feel as though they don't have to take responsibility for these issues. That's the issue. We have to make sure 230 doesn't just give them carte blanche. I, we have it, to make sure. And, and there's also a complete lack of transparency with these companies. So unlike other companies that are regulated, that provide information on their systems, their processes. These companies do not, mm -hmm. and it makes it incredibly difficult to figure out who who knew what and when. Okay. You know, but so what we do know are things like they say, "Oh, more content moderation," but they say they don't have an obligation. We have to, yeah, we have to, right? We we have to hold them to their representations, and we have to go behind what they're saying. I want to get to Miss Dell. Thanks a lot. I know that you said, uh, and thank you for being here. That's how your son lives on, and that's how how things how we. We learn. I have left. <laughs> but uh, you have just a few seconds. I'm, you said at the end of your thing you had some other things to share. I was going to give you some time. To oh, my goodness. Those, um, I appreciate that. So probably just one uh, thing now. Just, I'll just tell you real quick. Uh, we did about nine months of research interviewing experts on the subject, the subject, and we published a paper back in September, The Best Practices to Red Social Media of Drug Trafficking. I brought a few copies. I'm happy to email it out to whoever wants it, but the suggestions are in this, and I can always elaborate on those. And these suggestions actually don't even involve legislation. They involve a, a, a lot of accountability, so I'm happy to give these out and then send it out to anybody else who doesn't get one. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm out of time. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and our next uh, member is the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Ms. Neville, thank you for your testimony. I know it was tough. There are people watching this. I will tell you, this is the second time we've heard of a young person dying in this, in this month where we've had the parents in. 
to discuss it. Um, I took the opportunity to text my 22, 17, and 15-year-olds and, and just said, don't, don't go there. Don't get anything, A, illegal, but B, that's not from a legitimate <clears throat> pharmacy or from legitimate sources because you don't know what's going to be in it. And um, so I, I'm sorry for your loss. Hopefully my children won't be the only ones who are, their awareness is heightened to this. Now, because of serving on this committee, they usually roll their eyes uh, when I start talking about it, but I do think it's important that as parents, we all talk about it, and grandparents. Well, if you need that third-party validation with your kiddos, call me, I'm there. All right, I appreciate it. And it's not just, you know, so often we think, and sometimes the American public thinks that, it, you know, this is a, big city problem, or this is not us. Mr. Latta mentioned earlier that, that he and I have introduced the HALT Act, which deals with fentanyl analogs. Got some, we're still working on some of the language, but we're, we're hoping to have this thing worked out. Uh, probably should have been passed last year, but we're gonna get it passed this year. And so we did a statement when we released that <clears throat> earlier this week, and I received this from a community leader public figure saying that he had received it and then said nice things about it and then went on to tell me why this was important to him. And I'm now going to read from, without identifying him, because I didn't ask him for permission, but I will read from his, his email. My wife is a high school principal. Now, this is a rural area of Virginia. My wife is a high school principal. She has to wear latex gloves to search lockers for fear of fentanyl. And she has had to administer Narcan in order to save a student's life. Tell Morgan thanks. Thank everybody in this committee. We're working hard. We're not gonna solve all the problems, but we're gonna try. And we appreciate you all being here today to help us in our efforts to try to solve these problems. But when you have a, a good rural county where most of the folks, you know, think this is not their problem, and yet the high school principal has to wear gloves to search lockers and has used Narcan, this is a national uh, emergency. It is a national problem. And we're leading the charge, and everybody in here knows we've got to do something, but the American people need to know that we have got to take <clears throat> action, and in all fairness, this administration needs to understand that they need to take action across the board, but particularly on the southern border, where we know a lot of this garbage and poison that's coming into our communities is coming across the border and coming into the United States. Somebody's gonna have to help me on time because I can't see. All right, look back here. I got a little bit left. Um, it's it's a whole lot bigger, Ms. Goldberg, and I know you only have a handful of cases. Not everybody wants to go public, and I understand that. But it's a lot bigger than the eight cases you're currently involved in and the three others that you know. I mean, it's probably tens of thousands uh, every day across the country that are exposed, at least, uh, to this issue. And so I appreciate the work you're doing. Sheriff, thank you so much for what you're doing. Appreciate it. Is there something else that we in this committee can do? We don't have judiciary, so we can't create new crimes, but we can try to work on policies. Is there something else we need to be doing that we haven't looked at to your knowledge? Well, and I think uh, that you have referred to it and everybody here has talked about it a little bit, but if there could be some regulations that compel these companies, these social media platforms to, you know, be in compliance with court orders. You know, we're not, we're not looking to violate people's privacy rights um, in this country. And you is know. your experience that it's just Snapchat? Because I've heard of other problems too. Have oh, you heard no, of it is certainly not just Snapchat. Um, They're just the worst according to our witnesses. Okay. Yes. Unfortunately, my time is up. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The uh, next member to ask questions this morning is the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it, and I uh, appreciate the testimony from the witnesses, particularly Amy. Thank you so very much for sharing this story, and I'm so sorry to hear about your son. Um, I do want to share some stories because, again, that we've got to remove the stigma. <coughs> this could happen with any family. And uh, my friend over here, Morgan, is right. We've got to talk to our kids. And I try to do it on a regular basis. Um, so, and, and it is not just a Snapchat. Uh, it's all these social medias, and I have some examples here that I want to share. Um, I have a story here from um, my congressional district in Florida. Uh, a 35-year-old resident of Hudson named Zach had been successfully living in recovery for many years after struggling with addiction in his youth. Sadly, in June of 2022, he relapsed and overdosed on fentanyl-laced drugs. And I want to ask the sheriff, too. He talked about uh, drugs. Every drug is laced with fentanyl. Does that include, I assume that includes marijuana, because marijuana is a drug. He can address that a little later. Uh, but Zach was a beloved son, brother, and uncle. During the police investigation to his death, it was discovered that Zach had purchased a deadly fentanyl-laced product through Facebook Messenger. Another story from my district in Pasco County in Florida again. The Sheriff's Office investigated an overdose death investigation in <coughs> Holiday, Florida. The victim, Dwayne, was found dead in his work van, where law enforcement found a uh, hypodermic needle that contained liquid fentanyl in the immediate area. Dwayne's cell phone was also located within the immediate area, and upon review of its contents, recent narcotic-related communication was observed again through Facebook Messenger. The communication messages uh, revealed the facilitation of narcotics and a meeting location from two days before. It also included instructions to obtain the drugs in a parked car. The medical examiner's report revealed he'd overdosed on fentanyl. I wish these stories were unique, but sadly, as Morgan said, we know they are not. And in each of the cases, they were flagged to my office from our local sheriffs. They also used Facebook Messenger to obtain and facilitate the drug deal. Um, Back in 2018, I questioned Mark Zuckerberg directly about the illegal sales of opioids through online ads of pharmacies. He talked about the need for tools to go after this type of content proactively. But that was five years ago, and this, uh, the problem has gotten much, much worse. There's no doubt that big tech is not doing enough to curb this problem, and you've stated that. I believe federal law enforcement also needs to do a better job of coordinating and responding to emerging threats. The DEA, for example, is not taking this problem seriously enough, and there's a disconnect on both sides. This is why Congress and I introduced the CAPTURE Act, which would require reporting and federal recommendations on ways social media companies can better communicate, consult, and coordinate with law enforcement at every level, federal, state, and local. And uh, I want to, again, commend the, the chairperson for, for holding this, uh, this roundtable. Uh, we're not waiting to, to organize. We're holding these very serious roundtables, and I appreciate this being a priority of this committee. And I think we may need a comprehensive bill on this particular issue. Uh, Sheriff Knowles, can you ask that, answer that one question uh, with regard to marijuana? Is that, is that being laced as well? And can you tell us what your coordination is with social media companies, if any? What does a typical process look like for receiving privately held information from social media? And one more question. Do you have recommendations for how companies and agencies such as yours across the country can improve communication to quickly respond to drug sales? So in response to the question about uh, do we see fentanyl-laced um, marijuana, 
Um, I do not have any specific examples. In the state of Washington, um, marijuana is, is uh, legal and controlled. Um, so there's probably a lot less likelihood uh, that you know stuff sold over the counter, so to speak, would be laced with it. Um, can marijuana be laced with fentanyl? Absolutely. Um, and we still do have a black market and a gray market for marijuana in the state of Washington, even though it is legal. Um, and you will certainly find it there in those markets for sure. Um, what a typical process might look like, and, and again, this is not just for narcotics investigations, it's for all criminal investigations that might involve a social media platform. Um, typically, if we know we're going to be finding information on a platform, we will immediately send out a preservation letter to the company which lets them know whatever data you have, we need you to preserve. <clears throat> um, sometimes they comply with it, sometimes they don't. Um, a lot of times with that preservation letter comes a request that they do not disclose to the owner of that account that we are looking at it. Um, sometimes um, they comply. I will tell you that a lot of times Facebook and Snapchat will comply with the preservation and they will not notify the platform user. However, they will shut down the account, um, which really in a, in a kind of backdoor way lets them know that somebody's looking at their data because all of a sudden their account's shut down and they're not told why. Um, so that can be a challenge as well, particularly if we're trying to look at any ongoing evidence we might find. Um, and then we will then have our either uh, investigative analysts who I have given special commissions to because of their expertise. Um, they will write the search warrant for the data um, the historical data, if it's there. Um, and then depending on whatever the platform's policy is, we can get a return anywhere from 60 to 90 to 180 days later, even though um, you know, our, our court orders in the state of Washington and particularly in Spokane County say we have 10 days for the return of service, um, which we have to do a return of service that says, well, we're waiting on the information. So it can take quite a bit of time to get that information back. Um, and then it can take, you know, if the data that we receive exists, which many times we're told it doesn't exist, but a lot of times we'll get it back and it will be encrypted and not even the service provider has the encryption key. It has end to end encryption. So the data is useless to us. Absolutely. And I will add that we have, I am aware of one instance of somebody dying from fentanyl laced marijuana um, we simply see it, it's much more rare than other drugs. Well, thank you very much, and the gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, thank you for, for yielding to me. I'm, I'm a little bit speechless <coughs> because I, uh, having lost a grandchild, not the same conditions that you did, uh, Ms. Neville, um, I think only someone who has lost a child or a grandchild can know the pain that that is inflicted, a, a pain that never goes away, a pain that is exacerbated by what seems like such a senseless cause. And and so I'm uh, I'm humbled by your uh, by your willingness to tell your story. I while you were talking, I was I was moved. I have a freshman in college that's an athlete, he's a swimmer, they are constantly in pain because they stress their bodies at a, at a, uh, in ways that others don't. And I, I texted him and I said, look, I know you're constantly in pain, but don't ever take a pain medication that you get from someone else. If you're in that much pain, you come and talk to us. We will figure out how to get you what you need. Uh, don't don't do this. And so I, I was moved by that. And to uh, the rest of you, in defining the, the battle space that we're in, uh, in addressing this problem, I, because it's heartbreaking. And, and the devastating reality is we're losing our young people in, uh, in droves. I heard someone give a statistic recently that about every two weeks we have the equivalent of 9-11. About every two weeks across the nation we're losing nearly 3,000 of our young people uh, as, a, as a result of this. My district is no stranger to the dangers of, of fentanyl. I represent Appalachian, Ohio, 
it's a part of our nation that's been particularly devastated by the uh, opioid crisis now exacerbated by fentanyl. So we're actually quite familiar with it. And as I mentioned last week, we lawmakers, for us, it's critical for us to talk with families and individuals uh, who've been affected by fentanyl and with public health officials uh, and, and the first responders who have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis so that we better understand what the challenges are to keep these drugs, keep this drug out of the hands of our young people. Combating the crisis is going to take all of us uniting around common cause policies that, uh, or common sense policies that will mitigate the havoc that fentanyl is causing. And conversations like this one that we're having here today are so critical. They're good starting points in helping us move forward in that common goal, keeping fentanyl out of our communities. It's also critical, ooh, that let out smoke. So I don't know what, what happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we better call the electricians because it, it sparked fire. Um, and now it smells. Um, so we got to understand what the role of big tech is in uh, uh, <coughs> this crisis, not only to uh, the challenges to preventing access, but how dealers are accessing our kids through social media and, and these platforms, and they must be held accountable. Um, they can't claim to be tech providers, and yet they're providing content and directing the traffic. They can't do both. That's why Section 230 reform is so critical. Um, the Internet is a valuable tool, but as parents and grandparents, we know that we got to do a better job. So. Um, <laughs> Sorry for rambling, but I'm passionate about, about these things, and I look forward to continuing this very important conversation. Sheriff, what advice do you have for smaller enforcement departments like in Appalachia, you know, very small police departments that may not have access to the same tools or technology that you would in, uh, in your county, more sophisticated or that like uh, more sophisticated urban or metropolitan law enforcement agencies might have to combat this thing? What can, what can small communities do? So um, I think it's important to have strong relationships with federal partners um, because typically um, that is where you would go for you know, ex technical expertise. A lot of their analysts um, have the ability to help here. Um, so a strong relationship with some of your local federal officers or with a larger jurisdiction that does have access to those. Um, we provide regional services to all of the uh, agencies throughout Eastern Washington, um, which has been very useful to some of our smaller jurisdictions. Um, and we're, we're happy to do it because we know um, the challenges that we have just sure. keeping the expertise in-house. So I think those relationships um, are very, very important. Mr. Chairman, I was distracted by the fireworks. If I could ask one more quick quick question. I, I, I believe that the ability to freely innovate comes with the incredible responsibility of ensuring that your product doesn't cause more harm than good. So. Uh, in, in regards to this fentanyl discussion, uh, Ms. Marquez Garrett and Ms. Goldberg, from your experience, what are some of the things that we can do in Congress? And I know some of them are, are kind of top line. What can we do from a policy perspective to assist in the battle of holding big tech accountable for the harm that they're causing to, uh, to our users? Yes, so first I'd like to say that you just said a word that's very critical here, which is product. Right, so Section 230 relates to content. It relates to third parties. Many of these issues we're talking about when we refer to Snapchat, these are product issues. These go to the design of the product. Um, in fact, I'd like to say, you know, communicating versus connecting. So we do have, we do have children who meet these dealers in person, um, and then they communicate through other apps like Facebook Messenger. The Snapchat app, what we are seeing that is fundamentally different is this element of connecting. So in cases where these children, I mean, these are children, right, 13, 14 years old, they don't have vehicles, they're in school Monday through Friday, they're at home with their parents on the weekend. And so at least for us, the fundamental difference here, the product defect is, um, it's connecting these children to these dealers, it's giving them access. 
Um, so I think there, and I'll, I'll turn to Carrie in terms of legislation and other efforts, but some of this we can already do with what's in place. We just need to hold SNAP and other companies that are doing this accountable. We need to be able to get answers to questions. Yeah. Um, I will add that um, we need carve outs in section 230. Um, people need to be able to sue for catastrophic injuries. You know, it's nice to have Sheriff Knowles here who is taking a really proactive stance against the dealers, but we also need to empower people like Amy who lost everything to go after another party that's responsible, which is the platform. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much and thanks for the indulgence. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Indiana, Dr. Bouchong, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank uh, full committee chair McGorris Rogers for hosting the roundtable uh, to highlight and discuss the reality that illicit drugs like fentanyl are being advertised and sold to Hoosiers in Indiana uh, and across the country on online on social media platforms. Uh, I have four kids. My kids are older. They're 30, 28, 25, and 19, and I've been messaging to them for about uh, 15 years or more about the risks of this, and I, hopefully it's been effective. It has so far. But I want to say this. It's not only young children, but adult children that uh, are at risk, not only on social media, but just directly texting. A Wall Street Journal just outlined a story about three uh, professionals, the age of my kids, who got drugs they thought was cocaine, uh, and it had fentanyl in it, they all died. Uh, they were in their, their 20s. Um, so, you know, I have a, everybody has a case in their district, right? More than one. I have a 19-year-old woman, Elizabeth Duncan, lost her life to fentanyl and fentanyl poisoning uh, from counterfeit prescription pills that, that she got from a dealer online who was advertising fentanyl, marijuana, and firearms, believe it or not, on Snapchat one of many cases. So it's up to the people in this room to come up with meaningful and effective solutions so we can protect children in my district in Indiana and communities across America from these dangers and hold these platforms accountable. So, um, Ms. Laura Marquez Garrett, uh, I understand machine learning has played a central role in many of these social media platforms' efforts to detect drug-related content, such as advertisement for counterfeit pills that could be laced with fentanyl. Can you tell us about these programs and how effective are they in really detecting drug-related content? And can they identify content directed to users of different ages? Absolutely, so there are a couple of pieces to that. Um, I, let me start with sort of the technology that's out there. What we have started learning since the Facebook whistleblower came forward um, from Ms. Haugen as well as engineers and others in the field uh, is that these social media companies, um, they do have that ability to identify uh, for example, drug content, um, words, images, gun content, all of that. Um, it, the way the technology is designed, it's sort of like a lever, if you will, where you can program it for safety, which also gets false positives. You may get too much of the content, and you'll then have to go back, and, and you may have irritated users because you've taken down something that is not violating. Um, or you can program it on the lower end here for engagement, right? And engagement, you end up not capturing all of this. Um, you know, fundamentally, these are the most sophisticated tech companies in the world. They have the ability to capture all of this. They have the ability to turn that dial up to safety, and they choose not to. Um, I think the other issue, and, and if you could remind me, so that's sort of the AI piece. I think you yeah. asked another part of that question as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, basically that you answered that question. I mean, they... Can they identify users based on age? Of course, yes. people lie online about how old they are, right? Yes, so that's actually, that was the second part. Um, yes, they can, and there's a couple of pieces to that as well. One is there is the technology out there that can identify age. Um, that is a technology available. These companies choose not to use it. Uh, it can do a basic facial recognition and, and estimate age in a matter of seconds without pulling identification information. So there's not a privacy concern there. The companies choose not to use that, but even not using that, these companies, some more than others, collect incredible amounts of data on every user, tens of thousands of data points that these companies are constantly collecting and sharing. They have the ability to estimate age. You have photos that are being put up that show eight 10-year-old children. 
Um, and even without those photos and the content, we have children who say on their public profiles, I'm 10 years old, and those public profiles stay up. Um, but in addition to that, they also have the technology to take those data points and to determine this is most likely a 10-year-old. And I know at least some of these companies, uh, Meta included, actually use that type of technology for marketing purposes. So. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And I apologize for the sparks. Um, this has been very enlightening and um, disheartening, disheartening in some ways. Uh, but um, your willingness, all of you who have been involved with this in unique ways is, is, is special for us. This is, this is partially a um, email that I just sent to my, my three grandkids in Illinois, uh, two teenagers and a 10 year old and their father and mother, uh, so they will know what I sent. But I expressed that I was uh, sitting in a hearing in Energy and Commerce talking about um, social media, <coughs> big tech, and fentanyl, and indicated to them that fentanyl is making its way from the Mexico border to our nation's young people via social media platforms. Instead of cruising the streets, teenagers can find pills by watching a 30-second video on TikTok or logging on to Snapchat. Um, this is dangerous enough, but on top of that, an increasing number of these drugs are actually counterfeits laced with a lethal dose of fentanyl. I love you too much to have this impact your life. Drug dealers and those seeking to buy illicit substances often use ever-changing code words on social media in order to avoid flags from content moderators, while straightforward hashtags or use of drug names in videos usually get taken down, changing one letter to a symbol or using emojis helps evade the algorithm. Now I'm assuming that my grandkids probably know this already. Yeah. Their grandfather now appears to be a guy that just finally come to understand what they know already. <coughs> um, Ms. Marquez, <coughs> Garrett, <coughs> excuse me, how do you recommend that big tech keep up with these tactics in order to better take down drug accounts and protects, protect my grandkids online? So as a starting point, they turn up the dial, right? This is their programming, it's their product design. They turn up that dial for safety instead of turning it down for engagement. That would, be a, a, that would make a huge difference. Additionally, when it comes to children, particularly minors, you know, Snap, for example, in their terms, they say if you're under 18, you must have the consent of a parent to use our app. That is not enforced in any way, shape, or form. There is no easy way as a parent to report it. There is no, it, it's as simple as an opt-out list. If every parent were able to simply call or email Snap and say, this is my cell phone, I've purchased this. This is the device ID. This device must be blocked from Snapchat access. My child does not have my permission. Those numbers would drop, but so would social media engagement. They'd make less money because many many children would not be on these apps in the first place. These companies, I'll, I'll add one more point, they don't even have a 1-800 number. We have a client who literally drove to Snap's physical address because she was trying to report a dealer who killed her son. She could not get through to anyone. She could not find a 1-800 number. She drove to Snap's offices. Could she get in the door? No, she could not. In fact, she spoke with Snap's security and was asked to move her car or it would be towed. She was told this is not a retail store. You need an appointment to speak with someone, only there's no way to make an appointment. These, these products, these procedures, these companies have set it up so that parents have no possible way to protect their children. Yeah. Um, even when accounts selling drugs are found and taken down, there's little stopping the criminals from just creating a new email address and starting an account under another name. It feels like a game of whack-a-mole and Sheriff, um, what are some effective tools big tech platforms should be using to stop this from happening? And I guess the final is why, why aren't they? Well, I will, I will echo what uh, Ms. Marquez said, is they, they have the ability to store the data that we are looking for. They have the ability to monitor and track 
the traffic that's going across their platform. They seemingly can know everything there is to know about me as a private citizen, what I like, what I want, and what I want to buy. It is ridiculous to think that they don't possess the same ability to identify people who are using their platforms for illicit purposes. They do, but they have to be forced to do it. They, they have to be forced to comply with lawful court orders. They, they must be forced to retain the data that they know might be useful in a criminal prosecution. I'm not asking them to give it to law enforcement for free, but please be responsive to a court order. And they're just not. Thank you, my time has expired, I yield back. Thank you very much, the gentleman's time has expired and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here. This is extremely important. I believe that Representative Griffith mentioned just a little while ago, this is a second parent we've had this month, is it? Yes, this month. Sheriff, you are absolutely right. We've got to secure that border. It baffles me that Republican, Democrat, Independent, North, South, East, West, I don't, how can we not see that? There is enough fentanyl in this country right now to kill 7 billion people. Unbelievable. And you are absolutely right as well that there needs to be stringent, more stringent penalties. I, I don't care whose feelings are hurt. This needs to happen. Ms. Neville, I can, father of three sons, grandfather of six grandchildren, I can only imagine. I, I can't tell you. I, I wish I could articulate. I wish I could put in words, but I can't. But I want to ask you this. You mentioned, and, and please forgive me if, if this is too difficult, but you mentioned that the paramedics came, that your husband did CPR and paramedics came, and they administered the Narcan. How long was it? Um, it's hard to tell. I just know that the last time that I saw Alex alive was 9 p.m. the night before. The so last time? The last time I saw Alex alive was 9 oh, p.m. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so you don't know the I time. I don't know. Okay, well, maybe that's not the best example, though. But I want to talk about Narcan because you can get Narcan without a prescription mm -hmm. now. But most of, we, we left it up to the states, and a lot of states have it behind the counter. Mm -hmm. that, that it, and I'm a pharmacist, so, you know, you have to come to the, to the counter and you have to get it that way. Now, the FDA, as critical as we are of them, with good reason, they are actually taking proactive steps to come up and, and try, to get, try to get Narcan over the counter where you can get it without having to go to the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want any barriers. Look, Nar this is such a problem now. Narcan should be just like Ipecac syrup. Mm -hmm. It ought to be in every medicine cabinet in America right now. I agree. It should be in every first aid kit. Uh, I do want to point out, too, that Narcan is just one of the brands. What everybody really wants to get their hands on is naloxone, and there's different brands out there. And we need stronger because we know it takes more than just one hit of that naloxone to save somebody. Um, so there's other brands out there. I encourage everybody to go look them up and find one that you can get in your medicine cabinet as soon as possible. And if I may agree, every household in America should have this in their home. Absolutely, even, just like we have yes. the monitors. And, and, and Even if you only have small children, I had someone recently tell me, because mine are all very young, even if it's not your children you're concerned about, it could be your neighbor, it could be a friend. I couldn't agree with you more, and, and look, we, we sit here and we ask you, what can we do? And Sheriff, you, you, you make great points and, and, and both of, of our legal friends make good points here. Yeah, we gotta do something about 2.30. We, I'm, look, I, it's a heavy lift. We don't wanna suppress freedom of speech, but at the same time, if we don't do something, I've always said, if you don't do something, you're doing something. And if we don't do something, we're doing something and that is ignoring it. We can no longer ignore this. But the point about the Narcan, Mr. Chairman, and, and this is, we have jurisdiction over the FDA. Now, I will compliment them. They have been proactive. They've already started the packaging for it to be OTC. And they're waiting for the companies to apply for it to be OTC. We need to have, the next meeting we have like this, instead of having a third parent who's lost a child, we need the FDA in here. What can we do to get that done next week? It needs to be done ASAP. 
I, I, Sheriff, you're right. We got to close that border. We got to have the penalties. We got to do something about the platforms. But this is such an immediate problem and such a, a, an epidemic right now that we can do something on this committee. We can get the FDA in here. We can get Narcan, OTC. We can get it in medicine cabinets across this country. And it needs to be. When we were growing up, we had syrup of Ipecac. You, you had that in every medicine cabinet for poison. Now we got to have Narcan. So I'm, I'm appealing, Mr. Chairman, we need to have the FDA here. That needs to be the next step. And, and they are, again, to their credit, they are doing everything they can. They're expediting the process. But we need to see what we can do to help them expedite that process. I'm going to give you one thing about that process. So my understanding is this spring we should be seeing an over-the-counter version. However, it is only going to be a 2 milligram or a 3 milligram. Like I said, we know that the minimum 4 milligram is not enough right now. So putting the over-the-counter at a 2 or 3 milligram is giving us a false sense of security. So what we need is a higher dose available over-the-counter. So that's what you can do. Thank you. Thank you for that input. And again, thank all of you for being here. Ms. Neville, thank you so much for being here. And I yield back. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. And let's see, it's Dr. I think I had to step out, Dr. Dunn. Dr. Dunn. Oh, Dr. Dunn. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was sorry. looking up naloxone. <laughs> I was looking up naloxone on my uh, pharmacy after Buddy gave that impassioned speech. I wanted to make sure there were. <laughs> or in any uh, contraindications to it. Well, give me just one second, I'll get back to my questions here. Um, so I thought what I'd do actually, since the, the panel has so thoroughly answered the questions I prepared, uh, Dan uh, Crenshaw had, had some pretty good ideas. We were whispering back and forth. I think he texted you guys. And so I, this is for the sheriff. Um, <clears throat> Currently, we understand, I'm not a Snapchat person, but I understand that there's no uh, way for the users to report violations of community guidelines specific to selling drugs. I mean, but they do have those, that mechanism. So you, a box on the Snapchat that said uh, reporting somebody for dealing drugs on Snapchat, that would be possible, I believe. And if, if that was automatically referred to law enforcement, I think that would be a powerful uh, incentive for Snapchat to uh, to include uh, or to, to to police their site. What do you think, Sheriff? Well, I, cert I certainly think that would be possible. Um, it would be hard to anticipate how much that would be used. You know, depending on uh, you know whether people recognize it for what it is and and where people. Well, that's a reason for parents to go on Snapchat, right? <laughs> that, that that is correct. Um, so yes, it would it would be effective, and uh, hopefully at that point it would be nice if the platform, whichever platform that is, would automatically start retaining data on that account um, to give us time to to get to it through a legal process. We we have uh, a lot of people have talked about uh, scheduling the fentanyl analogs at Schedule One. That would make them illegal. That's good. We could also classify them as a matter of statute as poisons, which would then, as I understand, and I'm not a lawyer, as I understand that would, uh, would confer the possibility of uh, prosecuting drug dealers for homicide. Is that correct? So in the state of Washington right now, we, we do have a statute uh, you know, for controlled substance homicide. The, the challenge is that uh, usually everything we're going after is latent data data that's on the phone um, and we're trying to recover after the fact. Um, and the, the standard of proof we end up having to overcome with our prosecutors is the, the dose that the individual took, we have to prove that that particular dose came from this particular person at a specific time. It's never as easy as we, we on TV, huh? It's exceptionally challenging. Um, and again, with a 50% success rate of actually getting into the phone of the, the person who died, um, boy, we, we have a lot of challenges. And it's very tough to, to get a successful prosecution there. I've, I've filed again this Congress a, a bill to, make, uh, to classify the analogs of fentanyl, all of them, as weapons of mass destruction, uh, which actually gives the law enforcement some, uh, some extra 
uh, things that they can do uh, using DHS and whatnot. Also, international policing becomes somewhat easier. And, uh, <clears throat> and this, uh, to follow on that is a suggestion that Dan gave, and I, I urge you to remember this is Dan, uh, give, you, give you a suggestion, but I was amused that it came from him. Uh, uh, he has introduced a, a bill to uh, authorize use of military force against the cartels. That would, uh, that would seem to have, that I know that's pretty, pretty much of a reach here, but I, I did, was tickled when I read it and I thought I'd share it. You know, can I make one little comment? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, it works. But I want to go back to um, the uh, legislative piece. Um, I know we're not going to, you know, I don't want to get into the weeds with legislation here, but two things I just want to put a bug in your ear about that would address uh, the issues that and it will help law enforcement in their investigations is the uh, Rick Scott is, has the Social Media Act, and then there's also the Cooper Davis Act. Both of these have components that address the law enforcement piece, so that are really important. So keep your ear out for those, and hopefully you guys will take a hard look at Look at well, that. Thank, you, thank you all for coming and sharing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if I may, this goes back to accountability to these companies. So you mentioned in-app reporting. Um, Snapchat does have an in-app reporting button. In fact, one of our parents met with a Snap executive in 2021, learned about this feature, and was told you can report dealers through here. She then reported 10 dealers. Those dealers were not taken down. And in the documents, I'll make sure everyone has a copy of these. Um, in one instance, for example, there was a, a public posting beating all tickets, prices go hit the telly, this is a dealer, and she received back from Snapchat, thanks for reporting something in the app. It helps us protect the Snapchat community. We wanted to let you know that we looked into your report and have found that it does not violate our community guidelines. There are hundreds of stories of people trying to use the in-app reporting mechanism only to be ignored or to be told it doesn't report our guidelines. Yeah, so there, I think there's some real real traction to be had there. Well, thank you for that input. Madam Chair, I yield back. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Curtis, five minutes. Mr. Chair, so we've rightly so talked a lot about kids. I'd, I'd like to point out that uh, Utah has the highest birth rate in the country. Uh, my district has the highest birth rate per capita hospital uh, in my district. The U.S. Census data says that we have the highest household size and the highest number of children in the country in my district. Simply put, we love kids in Utah. Uh, I'm a good example. I have six kids and 15 grandkids. And uh, like my colleagues, um, some of them have pointed out how they've had this discussions with their family. Last Sunday night, I sat down with as many of them as I could gather and talked about uh, our previous hearing on fentanyl. And um, if nothing comes from this other than members of Congress and those that listen to this sit down with their families and have this discussion, that's a tremendous thing. And so as we talk about uh, the responsibilities of these companies, I understand uh, how unfair it is to place this burden on parents. But clearly, uh, the parents' uh, opportunity to educate their kids and their grandkids uh, is so, so important. So thank you for highlighting this. We'll have another discussion in the Curtis home uh, on this. Um, I'd like to explore a little bit more what the social media companies can do. And we've talked very little about algorithms. And those of you who are specialists on Section 230, I'd like to just for a minute um, get you to think outside the box. It seems to me that all the power that comes from these apps centers around algorithms and their ability to present data. We talked about the 10,000 data points based upon what these people will respond to. And I'm wondering if, if we shouldn't be focused a little bit more on algorithms. And one of the things I've thought in the past is a clear delineation on Section 230 that separates these people from the, the town square uh, model is that they they, not, they don't just post information. They decide what information is seen and magnified. And is it possible, as we look at Section 230, that we should, that we should be looking at this issue of the moment you evoke an algorithm, you lose your protection from Section 230? And I'd just be curious <coughs> from, from those of you who spend time on this what your thoughts are about that idea. Yeah, and, and if I may, I think it's an amazing question. Um, to be clear, social media is not the Internet. And I think we confuse that often, right? The internet, as we know it, is sort of these town halls, these bulletin boards. It's a, it's a system that uses an algorithm, um, but often these search engines, those algorithms start by user input. I say, I wanna see A, B, and C. That algorithm is designed to find A, B, and C. 
what is fundamentally different about social media algorithms, and I would distinguish that and say th these companies, social media company algorithms, these algorithms are not designed by starting with user input. They are designed, and we've, we've heard this from experts in the field, they are designed by starting with the ultimate goal these companies want to achieve. Engagement. Correct. And, and that is what makes social media algorithms harmful. Um, again, these companies, social media companies, these products are not the internet, and that is a huge and critical distinction. Ms. Goldberg, I know you're jumping to... <laughs> chomping chomping <laughs> yes, at the uh, bit. I'd love to hear your perspective. Um, well, you know, things might really change in this area um, with, with the Gonzalez versus Google case that's coming before the Supreme Court. This will be the first time that a Section 230 case will ever have been heard um, in the, you know, since 1996 when this um, uh, law came into, into fruition. And it is specifically looking at um, the targeting algorithm. And, um, and I, you know, like Section 230 was, was created to deal with content. Algorithms are a product feature. This is not content that users are creating, but it's, it's the, pr the product matching users with content that, that they, they think they would like. And it's, it's, um, it's just wrong for, it to, for these companies to have immunity when it comes to the, the content that they're feeding to people, regardless of who's creating it. It's, it's a product feature that they're feeding this material to people. So I'm running out of time, but I'd just like to plant this seed again that one possible reform to 230 is the moment an algorithm is applied to engagement, you lose protection for Section 230. I love it. Thank you. I, I yield my time. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman uh, from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first off, I want to thank you guys for being here and um, sharing your stories. I know how difficult that could be. And um, really, my only question is going to be to the sheriff. Um, we do first responder tours <coughs> in my district where I meet with all first responders, whether that's EMS, fire, or my police force, sheriffs, and local city police. And one thing that they encounter is fentanyl, whether they're treating someone in a wreck or arresting someone. And now they have to put on rubber gloves just to do a normal, even a Terry Frisk. And in numerous instances, an officer of the law has been exposed to fentanyl through a normal search of that suspect, only to feel the effects when he got behind the wheel to drive that suspect back to the station. And without a Narcan on their body or in their possession to stop the effects of that overdose, they probably would have lost their lives. So what can we do? First off, you all have problems getting Narcan for your officers and all first responders in your county. And what can Congress do to assist you in making sure that those that are running toward the danger and not away from it are protected. So thank you for that question. Um, I never thought um, in my career that I would have to have a budget for naloxone, and I do. Um, and to just give you an example of how frequently my deputies are using it, um, we had expended our supposed year's supply for naloxone in 2022 by the end of April. I had to go out and seek additional funding as we were finding that in some of our more uh, urban areas, we were using as many as 14 Narcan doses a week. Now, some of that is because as was stated earlier, we're having to give multiple doses of naloxone or Narcan to some of the uh, overdose victims that we encounter. Um, there is technology that exists that allows um, law enforcement to identify controlled substances without actually touching them, without, without actually having to use a field test kit um, through some HIDA funding, uh, high intensity drug trafficking area funding. Uh, three or four years ago, uh, we were able to procure one machine, um, and that is for a population of you know, 560,000 people and roughly seven to 750 law enforcement officers in our county, and we have one machine. It's not in the field with every officer, correct? 
It, oh, it absolutely is not. Um, it is completely underutilized um, for the number of contacts and the number of times we come into contact with somebody in possession of a controlled substance. Um, it would allow us to identify a substance as uh, presumptive fentanyl without actually having to handle it, which is important. But uh, gone are the days in law enforcement where you could field test a controlled substance and not worry a little bit about your safety. Um, you know, you're, you're having to handle a substance that is best handled in a controlled lab and people, you know, in hazardous material suits. And yet we're out there with latex gloves and, you know, nothing preventing inhalation or anything like that. So um, making more of those, uh, those pieces of equipment at $25,000 a piece um, available to officers out in the field, particularly those who might be out in rural areas and might not have, uh, you know, access to backup. Um, you know, the problem with, with being exposed to fentanyl is, is you don't know it's happened until it's maybe too late and it's hard to deliver that to yourself. Um, fortunately, we're an urban enough area that uh, we can be around other people uh, pretty quickly if we're starting to feel the effects. But in honest, you know, in, in full disclosure, the reason we carry, the reason we were allowed to carry naloxone was to self-administer if we're exposed. And yet we find we are delivering it to members of the public far more frequently than we are to ourselves. At the detriment of those officers possibly. And, um, you know, I can just visualize someone in rural Washington state, because it's a rural area. I've been to Spokane and been out from Spokane. Officer pulls someone over, suspected drug user or trafficker, had fentanyl in his pocket, residue in his pocket. Officer frisks that suspect, gets exposed to a very tiny amounts, all it takes. Processes the, the suspect, puts him back of the car, gets behind the wheel, and starts to feel the effects. Without the Narcan, it could be detrimental. So I've already texted my staff about is there a federal grant program? Can we reallocate some existing federal grant program to assist law enforcement and first responders across the nation with being able to obtain? And it could be the manufacturer incentives, I don't know, to make sure that all you guys in the first responder field have access to that to save the officer's lives or to save the victim's life. So uh, anyway, that's the only question I had. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to the speakers today. I greatly appreciate it. Extremely important uh, topic. So in Arizona, I represent um, parts of Phoenix and the suburbs of Phoenix. Um, obviously, we're a border state uh, as well. And so we've had more than 2,000 um, opioid overdoses in one year in 2021. Uh, and also that year we had 52,000 opioid-related hospitalizations um, and emergency department visits, a huge issue. Um, I put um, the blame on uh, an open border and I think the administration should also be more forceful with China um, on, you know, importing, uh, allowing the importing of these opioid um, fentanyl, especially. Um, but obviously, you've also talked about how social media plays a role. And so I don't know, my question to any one of you is in 2021, um, Chairwoman Kathy McMorris Rogers and now the Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan um, had some draft legislation on reforms for Section 230. And it basically got rid of the blanket uh, liability protections for large businesses. I think it's still, if I remember, still um, protected smaller businesses. Would, if, if you're familiar with that draft language, would that help the problem um, with the social media and um, drug, uh, uh, drug traffickers using social media to get to our kids? I'm, I am not familiar with that language, but I certainly plan to, to review it. Yeah, I mean, anything that provides a blanket removal of, of immunity 
uh, would, would go a long way. We're talking about our biggest platforms today um, as the ones that are responsible for um, the most fentanyl-related deaths. Um, so if, if, if Section 230 is completely removed um, regarding, you know, for those platforms, that would, that would be, you know, a huge improvement, and it would give parents who've lost everything the ability to hold these tech companies responsible, but it would also just signal to them. They would be incentivized mm -hmm. to be cleaning up the act on, on their, their platforms. That said, there are small platforms that are doing the devil's work, maybe not specifically related to fentanyl, but um, you know, I, I own a small business. I, I own a law firm, and I have to, um, you know, I'm just as vulnerable to, to lawsuits if I do something wrong or if I harm somebody um, as, as a large law firm. And so, you know, we don't want um, to let evil companies off the hook just because they're small. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, the other question I had, and you've touched upon it somewhat of what parents can do, but is there any way that a parent could totally prevent uh, their child from, let's say, uh, being on Snapchat? Can they, is there any way to um, do that? From no. being on it, they absolutely just have to not let them have it. And that would be the not only way. Not let them way. have a phone? or Not, not let, let them, them have um, Snapchat or any social media for that matter. But I can okay. tell you that just because your kid doesn't have social media doesn't mean they're not exposed to it. Uh, you know, there's kids that get harmed you know, there, there's these bullying groups on Instagram. I know a family personally that there, there's a very racist group on there, and they, somebody was posting pictures of their kid and saying horrible things about their kid on there. Their kid isn't on this platform. Their kid has nothing to do with it. it they don't have social media on their phone, but somebody, some, one of their friends is like, hey, did you see this? And there they are. So it, it's still seeping into the home. It's still seeping into their life, even though you think you're doing everything you can to protect them from it. And, and I would add that my answer would be no. Um, we at, at SMVLC, we represent over a thousand families of every political persuasion, every race, religion, background. Um, and we have seen parents who have tried everything. No phone, they get a phone from a friend. We have children, I, I mean, you would have to ban devices in schools. We have parents who have had to forbid schools from giving their children devices because children know how to get around the Chromebook, for example. I had a 12 year old explain to me how to copy the desktop so that you can bypass all protections. Um, and, and my specialty in my, in my prior practice was electronic discovery, and this was all new to me. Um, so my answer would be no. Without some sort of an opt-out list, a 1-800 number, without these companies actively providing mechanisms to help parents, mm -hmm. there is no way. Well, thank you. That's, you know, it's really good insight because, you know, I don't use some of these social media apps and I don't have young kids anymore. Um, so I'm thankful that you're here educating us on it because I believe we need to balance um, the, you know, because social media apps can do good things too, right? So it can do good things. It, it can also cause bad, bad things to happen. Um, and I think as a Congress member, I need to balance that out um, and figure out ways that we can address this fentanyl problem uh, through different aspects, whether that means reforming Section 230 um, uh, in, in, or other ways. And so thank you for your input. And I yield back. Well, thank you very much. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Joyce, for five minutes. Thank you. I want to thank the Chairwoman McMorris Rogers for her continued focus on this issue. We talked about having parents, Mrs. Neville, and just two weeks ago, parents from my district, Deb and Ray Collin came, who had just lost their son months ago from a fentanyl overdose. Fentanyl analogs continue to ravage our communities, harming families, your son, throughout America. Sheriff, I want to thank you for your comments. We listen keenly as you address us. We recognize that fentanyl, fentanyl analogs are pouring across our southern border. We recognize that those active components come from China to Mexico, and the majority of this poison, and that is what fentanyl is, 
This poison continues to come across our southern border. This will continue to be a crisis until we secure that southern border. It is imperative that safeguards are put in place to stop the spread of this deadly drug. I am an advocate like each and every one of you are for protecting our children. I am an advocate for making sure that those who want care have access to that care. But we all recognize that just one exposure to this poison, to this weapon of mass destruction, can kill so many. And we're seeing it throughout the United States each and every day. To that end, big tech is, pay, is playing a role in the murder of these innocent individuals. The rampant accessibility of fentanyl analogs is playing a role in that. And we on this committee make our pledge to you that we will continue to work to address this issue. And I look forward to that work ahead in the 118th Congress. My first question is for you, Ms. Marquez Garrett. Can you, we, we've talked about different social media platforms. And I recognize that there are top players in this. There are those who have the ability to ultimately protect the drug dealers. Do you have a top five? Do you want to talk to us about who, which individual platforms? Parents are listening to you today. Who are those that we need to be aware of? So we deal with, with parents, families, whose children have been harmed, frankly, across virtually all of the big players. Um, so, so harms in general, I, I certainly have a top five when it comes to the fentanyl poisoning of American youth. I can only name one. Um, we are working with 50 families right now and virtually all of those, not all, I think there's one or two, virtually all of those children were connected to dealers through Snapchat. We, you know, TikTok is popular among children. I have yet to speak with a family whose child was connected to a dealer through TikTok. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, Instagram at least is, is fairly popular with children. I have yet to speak with a family whose children were connected through Instagram. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you have individuals who will meet dealers in person and they may use Facebook Messenger, for example, to communicate. But when we are talking, connecting children to these dealers, um, it's Snapchat. I, and in fact, I'll add, you know, we talk about Signal and, and other apps where this data is just gone. I think those also are dangerous, um, but those are not marketplaces. Those are not places, you know, it's the equivalent of Snapchat um, creating a, a hangout spot where children and dealers can go and, and know that they're not gonna be caught, that they, so it's Snapchat. I'm, go I'm going to also ask Ms. Goldberg, because of your expertise in this area, to please address, where are, where are the guilty players, please? One other player that we haven't spoken about is Amazon. Um, we have a lot of lawsuits against Amazon relating to their um, sales of suicide products to, to kids. Um, and somebody recently sent me a screenshot of a pill pressing kit that a person can buy to make the counterfeit pills and to stamp them so that they look like an Oxy or a Xanax. Um, that's a crucial part in, in tricking buyers into, into purchasing these drugs and mistaking them for legitimate over uh, pharmaceuticals. And thank you for that clarification. I, I don't want to complete this, uh, Sheriff, without bringing your experience with law enforcement and how you've worked with big tech platforms to address the issue of fentanyl and its analogs. Do you think that a public messaging campaign with big tech involvement and law enforcement, do you think there could be a component that we could make families, parents, and communities aware? Oh, I absolutely think that is something we should undertake. Um, it is going to take several different solutions attacking this problem from every angle we can. Um, public education is certainly a part of that. Um, you know, the DEA has undertaken a program about education um, and uh, specifically Spokane County is one of, I think, 11 nationwide areas where we are um, actively taking a, a public education campaign forward. Um, to the degree that we can get social media platforms to, to engage with us and help educate, um, I think that would be very, very effective. Um, and it would counter some of the things um, our children are coming into contact 
Thank yes. you all for being here today. This testimony is incredibly important. My time has expired. I thank the chairman. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Blog post from SNAP on October of 2022. We continue to strengthen our AI and machine learning tools that help us proactively detect dangerous drug activity. That should sound familiar to everybody in this committee. It's basically the same thing Mark Zuckerberg said in 2018. We need to do is build more AI tools that can proactively find that contact. Same message from CEO Jack Dorsey. We are moving fast. We have various methods of identification, most of them automations and machine learning algorithms to identify these in real time. I'm sure we could pull another 100 quotes saying the same thing from every big tech firm. A promise that innovation. Who was your first quote? Huh? Who was your first quote? I couldn't catch it. It was a blog post from Snap. Ah, gotcha. from Snap. Thank you. A promise that innovation will eventually solve content moderation problems which is code for don't touch section 230 because that'll destroy our profits. I'm not claiming that AI and machine learning aren't, aren't helpful in preventing these harms or that tech companies shouldn't continue to develop these tools. SNAP says that these tools proactively identify 90% of illicit drug activity and the platform prior to users reporting it. What I'm saying is Congress should no longer accept big tech's answer that AI is the only solution to content moderation. Ignore tech's pleas to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Too often we have accepted that answer because we didn't understand the technology and we were unsure of what the next question to ask was. We assign civil li li liability as both a duty and a liability. Courts are costs are imposed on those with a duty to mitigate harm and if they fail to mitigate that harm, they are liable. Section 230 in exempts information content providers from that civil liability based on a, 30 a theory that the third party is responsible. Yet that third party is often not the entity making money. Most drug dealers live in their parents' basement. It's the information content provider, the platform. We are seeing harms that flow from the misuse of these platforms. The question isn't whether tech is completely responsible for illicit drug sales. They aren't. It's been happening for 100 years. It'll continue to happen for 100 more. The question is what duty we should impose on those platforms to mitigate illegal illicit drug sales. The answer can no longer be 230's near total immunity because that regime says that despite the societal harms coming from the platforms, we are going to redirect the duty and the cost elsewhere, often to the victim. I already have a products liability bill that reforms 230 liability to allow platforms to be held liable in certain instances of <coughs> products liability. And there's lots of jurisdictional questions. Products liability is usually a state issue, but that framework is unrealistic for big tech and it needs a federal response. And with all due respect to the sheriff and how hard your work is, fentanyl's poison. And with and, it, and it's essentially an illegal products liability case, and it also needs a federal response. So as we continue to work forward and move through this, we have to understand the policy. We have to understand, I mean, from the law enforcement side, you have a case, and then the next state over has a case with the same user, and the third state over has a case, and all of these things exist. But my question is for the lawyers, and uh, in, in particular, because we'll talk about the liability shield, and we'll deal um, hopefully figure out the right and a proper approach to do this. But can you talk a little bit about the evidentiary challenges you face, even if we get rid of that? I mean, 90 days, SNAP holds whatever for 90 days, is an incredibly short amount of time. It's a short amount of time in a criminal proceeding, really a short amount of time to try and get a court order and a preservation order in a, in a, in a civil proceeding. So not only do we have to deal with the products liability shield, we have to make sure that the evidence that we need to prosecute or hold somebody civilly liable for these cases is protected. So I'll start with Ms. Goldberg. Um, you raise a, a very important point because uh, a lot of these companies have auto deletion of, 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 of evidence that <coughs> would be really important by the time they come to a lawyer, uh, that stuff is long gone even after we send a, a preservation letter. Um, but you know we have courts that that can can actually say, well, that's spoliation. Uh, it's, it's spoliation if you if you delete material that's that's related to a lawsuit or likely to 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 be one. I await the moment when we can actually have evidentiary battles with big tech. And I'm having my first. This is one. kind of an unfair question because you haven't got there yet. I I'm having my first one where we overcame Section 230 in um, a case in Oregon. We're, we're, we're starting this process, but it hasn't been done. 
Yeah, and I, the only thing I, I would add, so you know, as Carrie mentioned, that you do have a duty to preserve once there's ongoing litigation. We, we haven't gotten there because of Section 230, um, but the, the real hurdle in, in the case of Snapchat or Signal or other apps like that is that the evidence doesn't exist. They will preserve for 90 days what exists, um, but we have you know, subpoenas they respond to, and there's zero data on a given user. Um, and so I would say fundamentally it's going to, in the first place, the product itself and saying, wait a sec, you know, they're, the data that these law enforcement, men and women of law enforcement needs, it just doesn't exist. Well, and I just think it's important to already think about that. I mean, we can have the, we can, re, we can remove the liability shield, but if we don't have the evidentiary, if there's not a way for preservation of evidentiary evi or evidence, we're still gonna have a whole different set of problems that we should address on the front end and not come back. Yes, though removing the liability shield will motivate these companies yeah. to try harder. And, and we'll also have the evidence that exists on the user's phones. We'll have their, their injuries, their deaths is, you know, like, I'm not scared of the evidentiary issue. Gentlemen, you're back. back. Now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Ebel, it's apparently going to be three years this summer since you lost uh, Alexander, and I know that's got to be hard for you. You made the comments in your statement that uh, you had him for 14 years. If this is any condolence, just remember, he had y'all for 14 years too, okay? Folks, <clears throat> this is so important. I think you also made the comment, Ms. Neville, that this is almost equivalent to 200 people a day going down an airliner. It's actually more than 200 people a day. In the Texas legislature, I was on the Borders Committee and on the, and on the Pub Ed Committee. <clears throat> We've got to secure our border. Uh, we're under attack by Chinese fentanyl by the drug lords of Mexico. Uh, to put in perspective <clears throat> for my colleagues on the committee, Texas has about 1,022 school districts. According to Ballopedia's uh, current numbers, five and a half million students. So if you do that math, it's a, an average school district is about 5,045. <clears throat> when you brought in 70,000 unaccompanied minors, some before last, K through 12, you just brought in 14 Fourteen complete school districts across the southern border that somebody has to pay to educate. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Why isn't anybody paying attention to the fentanyl deaths? Is it okay for us to bring in 14 complete school districts of students and do everything we can to take care of them and not pay attention to our own children that are getting killed by the fentanyl? <clears throat> coming across the border. We've got to get a handle on this. I hope this committee, Mr. Chairman, will examine every single option it can. I'm gonna go to the lawyers now. Um, uh, Carrie Goldberg, how does Snapchat get its income? The, the eyeballs. So it's actually an advertising company. Uh, it makes money from companies that are advertising to the users. Um, and so that's, that's why there's so much conversation about engagement. The, the longer any individual stays on the, pr the product or the more people that you actually have on the product, then the more money these companies can actually collect from, from the companies that, that um, buy advertising from them. They also are very, very wealthy in user data. Uh, that's, that's a resource that that they use internally to maximize the, um, the time that people use. But when we, we think of, of consumers as the individuals who are using these products, but no, we're, we're the raw resources. Um, it's actually the, the, um, the advertisers that are their true customers. So I don't guess there's a way to go after those advertisers. You can't make necessarily that connection. And I have a Snapchat uh, app that I just downloaded for whatever reason about three months ago. I don't get any ads that I'm aware of. It's kind of crazy. Maybe I'm not active enough. But I was curious about that. Um, and Sheriff, I guess I'll come to you. Is there such a thing as doing a sting by setting up a Snapchat uh, profile and pretending to be somebody and inviting someone to come sell you drugs like happened in the Neville family? 
Well, quite frequently, we are required to set up accounts um, to do undercover purchases and undercover communication. I mean, it's not only on social media accounts, but sometimes in uh, some money apps like Cash App and things like that for you to even make contact and to actually uh, get the deal done, so to speak you do have to create that profile online. So that does allow some visibility and you know we can preserve evidence there, but it's some of the, um, what I would call tertiary contacts where we can't see the other people the, deal, the dealer is contacting and there's no preservation of that evidence um, is where we start to run into problems. So it's really easy to build a case you know, in an undercover fashion by going direct to that person, but you can't do anything with their supplier and other people that they may be dealing right, with. Right, thank you. And I, I wish Jay Obernolte was here because I'm not versed in this electronic stuff, and I believe he is. He owns a company that does that kind of uh, gaming and stuff like that. But again, maybe there's an app that should be developed that automatically stores everything on this cell phone and so it can't be deleted permanently. Maybe that's a way for him to make money. Mr. Chairman, I've got three seconds left, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you all can see, uh, I'm, well, the group you're, that you're talking to now are very new <laughs> on this uh, committee, and I want to thank all of you uh, for sharing. I've been on Agriculture and educa Education and uh, Workforce Committee and I'm uh, tickled to death to serve on this committee, but I will tell you today, uh, I am devastated by what I'm hearing, and I wish every American uh, could hear this. Um, uh, Sheriff, uh, I believe in law and order. In fact, my parents instilled in me Romans 13, that God establishes all authority. And he gives that authority, he's given you that authority to use the uh, sword to deal with evil. Um, they also taught that the scriptures tell us, particularly our children, to guard their hearts and minds. I wish they'd have drilled a little bit of that, more of that into me, because I have, uh, as a teenager and in college, probably needed to protect that a little more, and, uh, and, and I confess that. But, uh, uh, it, you know, and as a member of Congress, we take an oath to, uh, to uh, support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And it's obvious here to me today, and I don't know why the American people don't know this, but we are at war and we don't even know it. I mean, how can you kill this many people and get away with it? Uh, it's obvious that the Attorney General and the uh, administration has no plan to deal with it. Uh, and you say, well, what can Congress do? This Congress has the power to declare war. Why aren't the American people, this country will always be a grassroots country, why are not the American people screaming over the phones to these congressional offices to declare war on these cartels as a terrorist organization and let's send our military down there to deal with it as a first step and a signal to the rest of the world, you're not going to do this to this country. Now that's a little extreme, but how else are we going to solve this problem? And I'd, I'd like to get your feedback on it. Sheriff, I'll start with you. Well, sir, I don't think that that's an extreme idea. Um, I believe that this fentanyl crisis um, manufactured in China is, um, you know, to use maybe a militaristic term or maybe a law enforcement term, it's functioning as designed. It is completely and entirely intentional that this crisis is being brought into this country. And we should be willing to do all things necessary to stop it. Now, that doesn't mean just enforcement. Yes, we do need to address these cartels. We do need to quash them. Well, we also need to provide treatment to the people in our country who are suffering from it. 
Well, obviously, we're live streaming this. I would hope this, would, this, this hearing today would go viral and the American people would wake up and understand exactly what we're dealing with. Dealing with. Ms. Neville, you yeah. look like you. Well, I, one comment. of the things that we're really up against, as far as the general public is concerned, is we're a heavily stigmatized society. You know, I inevitably somebody will probably email me after this and tell me that I'm a horrible parent and it's my kid's fault for putting the pill in his mouth in the first place. It happens all the time. You know, there we tend to blame the user in these cases, but when we're talking about people who thought they were taking a single oxy and die from it, that's not, you know, they were deceptively sold something. You know, if you came to my house and I made a cake that had poison in it, did you die of a cake overdose or did Ms. you Neville, die? Neville, your child was murdered. Absolutely, absolutely. But we need to start changing the public perception of the folks that are using drugs. I've heard it from people when I try to talk to them about these issues. Oh, well, my child would never do that. Okay, mine did. What's your perception of a child that does this? Let's, let's really talk about this here. So until we can change those perceptions, we are going to be stuck in this mess. Ms. Goldberg, I have 21 seconds, but we're looking at a criminal activity here by social media companies. Now, is section, I know Section 230, I don't think it covers criminal, but why can't we use the criminal law to deal with these people who perpetrate this stuff? Why can't we use criminal law to deal with the tech companies? Because you're right, there is no immunity when it comes to criminal laws against social media companies. Our law enforcers never actually go after them, though. Um, and, you know, the cartel that, that I think we really need, need to be focusing on are the social media companies which are aiding and abetting the, the delivery uh, and the matching of, of users to sellers. Well, my heart goes out to you. Grassroots America, let's get with it and let's, make, let's stop this nonsense. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you to the gentleman from Georgia. At this time, I would like to recognize the gentleman from Idaho. Mr. Thank Fletcher. you, Madam Chairman. And as we've gone through this hearing, the questions that I've had have been addressed one at a time right down the line. So I'm not gonna repeat those, but I wanna make a couple of comments and then uh, maybe steer this to a slightly different place on a related note. Uh, first of all, Mr. Dunn had uh, mentioned that um, eventually military involvement against cartels might need to be considered. I think that's where this is going eventually. Uh, you've got, we've got to cut this thing off at the source and has been brought up China, uh, uh, Mexico, and these, the strength of these cartels, that's going to have to be addressed. Sheriff, I think you'd probably agree at some point in time and uh, whether we engage there, we'll find out. The other thing, as Mr. Weber pointed out, I think is, needs to be underscored is with uh, the Snapchats and these, these uh, bad actors in this case, whatever the solution is, is going to have to hit them in the pocketbook. Mm -hmm. And uh, where they make money is where they're motivated. And so, do I have the, the answers? No, but do I know what part of it includes? Yes, that's cutting off their revenue stream. And so, uh, that would be the second thing. Now to segue just a little bit, because I wanna see if there's a connection here. This is for uh, uh, Ms. Goldberg. When you file your lawsuits, or, or, or when you, you bring on this legal challenge. What are the existing statutory tools that you use? Uh, the, 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 uh, the basis for the lawsuit, what, where is that anchored in law? And is there an opportunity to amend that in order to strengthen your case? Mm -hmm. So the, the um, causes of action that we use when we sue a company, um, for a dangerous occurrence on their platform are product liability claims. So we claim that this is a defective product or there was a failure to warn or it was defectively manufactured and, um, and also negligence. And sometimes we use um, commercial practice violation laws uh, depending on the state. The issue is not so much that we need new statutes in order to bring lawsuits, although I'm in favor of that as well. Um, it's, that, it's that Section 230 is used as a defense. And so it's what enables companies to just get out of court free. Like it's a get out of jail free card. So as soon as I file a lawsuit, their first line of defense is to 
file a motion that says, well, we, we should have immunity under Section 230. And, and then that's just, if they win that, then it cuts everything off and we don't get to go into the discovery process. We don't get to exchange information. Um, and, and they also cripple plaintiffs earlier than that because their, their lawyers are so arrogant in thinking that they will never be held accountable for whatever the problem is that they, they say, like, our, our clients don't even have a duty to, um, to make a safe product because Section 230 says they don't have to. Got it. Thank you for that. And that makes sense. And so thank you for that explanation. Let's ship very quickly. Sheriff, um, once again, and you've underscored, and this has been brought up numerous times, the, uh, the, the border issue is, is part of this, a big part of this problem. Let me ask you about apprehensions. Let me ask you about um, when, you, when you uncover this, when you find this, when you make an apprehension, have you noticed any trends specifically gang-related not gang related? Are these independent dealers? Have, have we got a, a, a new class of distributor here uh, where they're more independent or is this primarily gangs who have diversified? So these are both gangs, um, you know, in the, in the defined legal sense that are trafficking narcotics to support their gang activity. Um, but there's also, you know, cartel level drug trafficking organizations that are pushing this. Um, I don't know that there are any new um, entities that are, and kind of one-offs that are pushing fentanyl, um, but all drug trafficking organizations and all gangs are on some level dealing fentanyl, and they're using social media to do it. Great. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, you go back. All right. Thank you to the gentleman from Idaho. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's see. Is that working now? Yes, there it is. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the panel for being here uh, this morning and this afternoon uh, to, to discuss this important issue. Uh, I'm afraid that my home state of Ohio has been especially impacted by fentanyl hitting our country, county country. Ohio ranks in the top five states in deaths by fentanyl and is sixth overall in overdose deaths. During a raid in my hometown of Zanesville last month, law enforcement was able to seize over 1,000 grams of fentanyl, enough to kill nearly every person in my congressional district. I'm grateful for the work of law enforcement to help get this off the street, but Congress needs to work harder to ensure our children can access and purchase any of these drugs so easily through social media. My first question is for the whole panel. Uh, as you are well aware, sometimes an array of apps are used for the advertising, messaging, and payment of illicit drugs. In fact, three or four different apps can be used just for one sale. What can Congress do to incentivize these different companies to work together to combat the sale of illegal drugs on their platforms? Amy, I'll let you go first if you don't mind. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that we, we need to hit them in their pocketbook uh, until there is a hit to their, uh, to their profits. They're really, what, what, why would they do anything, right? Uh, you know, these are billion dollar companies we're talking about. They're not going to do anything anytime soon that's gonna mess with that. Okay. Congress could require that social media companies, cash apps, report any drug-related activity. So we have something um, for child pornography, and child sexual abuse material, where those platforms are required to report to NCMEC anytime they're aware of, of child pornography on, on their platforms. We could have the same thing with our social media companies, and I, I think the, the Cooper Davis Act um, uh, addresses that very issue. Uh, so it would, if, if there was a, um, a centralized database, uh, it, would, uh, it would foster the cooperation of these companies. Okay, thank you. Do you like that, are you good? So uh, again, I agree, hit them, hit them in the pocketbook. That's, that's what's going to make a difference. It's, it's all revenue driven. Um, you know, both for the social media companies and 
or drug dealers. I mean, obviously, incarceration is great. Very, uh, you know, it, it's easy to prove the intent of a drug dealer. It's very hard to prove intent on a on a social media company, as far as criminal. Thank you. Uh, my follow-up question would be, uh, you know, everyone has shared their story, especially you, Jamie. I appreciate that very much. No parent should have to go through what you've experienced. Um, you passed off to Mr. Pfluger and I your booklet there, I believe, the 22, 2022 Best Practices, which was fantastic. To read social media of drug trafficking report touches on independent NGO enforcement. Can you elaborate on what independent enforcement from the NGO might look like in this context? <laughs> Um, I think that we really, one of the biggest things that I am probably most passionate about are is the that third party auditing piece. So bringing in people who are unbiased, they don't have any ties to these social media companies to go in and look at what they're doing and then essentially give them a grade. Here's what they're doing, that's, you know, they're, they're completely missing the mark, here's what they need to do. Here's what's working. Here's what's not working. Or they're, or they've got it. Because at this point, there has been so much death and destruction through these apps that they've lost the right to police themselves. They tell us, oh, you know, I hear Snapchat says they're doing X, Y, and Z. Well, the problem with that is Snapchat is saying they're doing it at this point because there is no way to verify that. There is, we have to take their word for it. And again, at this point, there's no reason why we should believe them. Okay. Thank you. Would this be more in a collaboration with social media companies, and you've kind of said that, or with local law enforcement agencies? I, 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 I kind of see it being a kind of multi-agency type of thing. We bring in people from organizations. I think there's the Organization for Safe Social Media, amazing organization, amazing education out there. Bring in somebody from that group. Bring in somebody from law enforcement. Bring in people with these different expert perspectives that can really take a hard look at the data that SNAP claims and, and see if it fits. Thank you very much again for being here. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next, the gentlelady from Tennessee is recognized. Yeah, I don't know if you can push it. Oh, there it is. Oh, one more time. Can you hear me? Okay. Listen, Mrs. Neville, I'm so sorry for the loss of your son. At, you know, I'm a mother. And I have a son, I have two grandsons, and I mentored middle-aged children my whole life. And uh, these kids are naive. They don't understand. And I have many friends who have lost the same exact case, go upstairs to wake their child up, and, and they're dead. You know, I'm a pharmacist, and I was currently on Homeland Security. And I'm looking at letters, at, and I'm in the, currently in the GOP Doctors Caucus, Marionette is as well. And I'm looking at a letter we sent to Secretary Mayorkas about the border and how the DEA reports that over 80% of fentanyl enters the United States smuggled across our southern border. I'm looking at a letter that several members of Congress sent to the Biden administration that talks about the history of foreign actors weaponizing fentanyl and that Russia has previously weaponized fentanyl analogs to incapacitate Chesson, Chesson terrorist forces. These are weapons of war. Now there's a new one, and the sheriff will understand there is a problem now, and we know that there's a number of substances been, being added. These kids are going after Percocet. They're going after Adderall. Uh, they're going after uh, Xanax. They think, because they look identical. We know that methamphetamine, we know that cocaine, we know that heroin, everything has those additives of fentanyl. It's a cheap filler. We know that it only takes the amount of two grains of sand to kill you dead. And when your officers are transferring evidence, they can absolutely transfer that through their skin. Now there's, we talk about Narcan, okay, that is readily available. There's Good Samaritan laws in all these states. You know, they fill vending machines up at, at uh, sheriff's departments. They're gone before they can even turn around. They have to refill those machines. Now there's a new threat and it's uh, the xylazine that is a horse tranquilizer. It's not an opioid. There's no reversal for that. You can get these addicts on the street and they'll sleep for 30 some hours because it knocks them out. It's a non-opioid. They can get it online with the vet RX. It's a domestic vet supply. You know, that's a cheap filler. 
you can't reverse that. It's a non-opioid. Now we're finding, especially Philadelphia, 15% of the overdoses or the drugs have this particular component in it. You know, and I took notes today because this interests me. Uh, permanent auto deleting of the content. You, you, they can promote false claims. You know, no legal obligations to monitor. This is unbelievable. As a pharmacist, I have to document everything. These people are not, a, they, they don't have to be, they're not responsible to anybody. And it is absolutely time to change that. I'm looking at a letter that the United States Senate sent to Snapchat, to Instagram, to YouTube, to TikTok. And Kat and I know in Marionette, we were all on Homeland together. We know that the cartels use TikTok in these modalities to recruit cart cartel members. There's no difference with this. There's no difference. These drug dealers they're recruiting might as well be recruiting cartel members because that's the same thing in my eyes. It's true. And their questions talked about, you know, four in 10 pills contain a lethal dose of fentanyl, just like your son got, just like my friend's son got. They ha I don't know if they've even answered this. This was September 13th, 22, that the senators signed this letter and sent it um, to these organizations. And Sheriff, you may know this. Uh, how many accounts have they removed? You know, these children don't understand the lethality of the drugs, okay? And each of those companies noted that their ability, they noted they had the ability to detect harmful content like illicit drug sales on their platforms. They have already told us they can do that. So where's the mechanism to mandate that they tell us what they're doing. We don't want to suppress freedom of speech. We want to save lives because this is a poisoning of America. How many accounts have they removed for drug-related activity? We don't know that. What data are you sharing with law enforcement when you identify a drug dealer on your platform? Do they ever tell me, tell me about that? That's one of the questions they've asked. I don't know if they've got an answer. So we do not receive any reports proactively from them. Um, as far as what information they have provided, what don't. those numbers are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet you don't. So you've got to use your law enforcement members to go out. Plus, you know, I remember asking our police force in Little Oak Kings Fort, Tennessee, how many people do you have monitoring social media sites to protect these children, not just for illicit drug use, for sex trafficking, for all these things? They're like... We're down 20 officers, we need 28. And then even at a round table with North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, do you know how many people raised their hand that said, we monitor social media sites? One, you don't have enough funds to do this. There are no parameters. These people do what they want, don't they? So my little notes say, we've got to stop them or stump them, one or the two. We're not here to kill you, we're here to make you accountable. Am I correct, Mrs. Neville? Am I correct, my attorney friends? Yeah, absolutely, correct, absolutely. We have to put accountability measures in place without hesitation because you know as well as I do, just like I just told you, they're gonna come up with new things that we can't reverse. And in my mind, it's on. I'm so happy to be part of this committee. I want you to know that. I have worked to get here because these are things that you cannot, we cannot delay the answers. And everybody thrives if you have accountability, am I correct? And every day delayed is, is more dead kids. Absolutely. You know, we're going to lose a whole generation if we haven't already. And it just continues on. And the government says, we'll address that. No. It's like anything. As a parent, you give them two choices. You're going to like both of them. They may not, but the time has come. And uh, I guess I don't have a question. I'm just getting your feedback. <laughs> uh, well, well, I did have a question for the sheriff. He, he didn't, you don't have any feedback. Yeah, we, don't, we don't receive proactive reporting yeah. from them at all. Um, and it would be nice if we did. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Well, their data disappears. How can they keep track of it? What about <laughs> exactly. that? Well, and the gentlelady's time has expired. Yes. Well, if you thank you to later. the sassy lady yeah. from Tennessee. Okay, well. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentle lady from Iowa, Ms. Uh, Miller Meeks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I uh, certainly want to thank ENC for putting on this very important uh, roundtable, and I'd like to thank all of our witnesses, and, um, and also uh, Ms. Neville, my heart goes out to you. 
Um, I'm certain that you receive the communications from other people that you do. Um, and I think that the barriers that have been in place when I grew up as a young lady um, and that other, uh, you know, now adults who are parenting young children had in place where you had a, so uh, you know, a social construct where purchasing drugs, especially illegal drugs, was seedy, it was underground, uh, it was ostracized, it was shunned. That occurred in areas of town you didn't want to go to, and if you drove through those areas of town, you wanted to make sure your car doors were locked and you had a full tank of gas. That does not exist in this new underground world, which is now full uh, in front of our children, regardless of what age, regardless of what social class, ethnicity, religion, whether you're urban or whether you're rural. And for those who think that Congress or the law doesn't really have a place in this spectrum. Let me just say as a physician, you cannot mail prescription drugs. That is illegal. It is illegal to mail prescription drugs, number one. Number two, you have to prescribe Oxycontin, Valium. You have to have a DEA license to do that. You have to have, you know, there are regulations that gauge all of those drugs. If you're in the commission of a crime, Sheriff, if you're the driver in a drug deal, you're liable. But yet companies are using disappearing messages knowing that they are being involved in the commission of a crime, whether it's drug dealing, whether it's selling the drugs, whether it's where the money goes, whether it's delivering the drugs into households. And we as parents are supposed to be the ones that are solely responsible for making sure that our children, one, aren't on the apps, or two, don't have a phone, or three, don't get involved with people who, because of the way social media is, and the way they've grown up with social media, they see it as a non-threatening way that they can communicate with their peers. So I think there are certainly things that we can do. One, can we require, and I, it's not anything I've heard yet, for uh, the social media companies to do PSA ads, just like we did when some of us were growing up, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, to do PSA ads, not just on illegal drugs, but any drug that they think is legal that is being sold over the internet in violation of law, because there are laws that exist for prescription drugs. Number two, What's our relationship with DEA, Department of Homeland Security? We've heard about the border, but just like we catch sexual predators online, is, you know, is our law enforcement and our national law enforcement involved with you on a local law enforcement level that we're setting traps to catch people so that they know they're being monitored online and monitored even in areas that disappear? So I think there's more that we can do beyond looking at Section 230 in order to try to intercede and interdict, in addition to which, education of our children, you've already heard, education of parents especially, and then I absolutely think there is culpability. And for those who think that they're not culpable, that they are not liable, again, if you participate in the commission of a crime, our laws will be, you know, we will uh, modernize our laws to make sure that those that are um, complicit in criminal endeavors are held accountable. So Sheriff, is, do you have cooperation with the DEA, uh, with other law enforcement, federal law enforcement agencies? Is there talk of setting you know, maneuvers to have people online to catch people that are drug dealing, selling drugs, whether they're prescription drugs or illegal drugs? Both are the same because they're using a prescription drug as a lure into other illegal activities. So yeah, that's a very good question. Um, in Spokane in particular, we have very good relationships with our federal partners. Um, I have several deputies um, who are assigned to federal task forces. They have uh, federal deputizations. Um, so we, we have made the overt steps to staff and fund an intelligence group in Spokane that uh, is proactively trying to monitor as much uh, online traffic as we can. Um, it's, the, the volume is staggering, um, and, and a lot of times 
you know, we're focusing on, um, you know, domestic terrorism, international terrorism type traffic. Um, but yes, we, we do take some steps to monitor it, as difficult as that is, um, because it is a huge problem. Cooperation from our federal partners, I could not ask for better cooperation. Um, we just need uh, cooperation from these companies. You spoke about culpability. I mean, for, for a company to know that this type of activity is going on on their platform, but yet they continue. I think that shows at least recklessness. Um, and some other platforms, such as um, Signal and Telegram, where they actually advertise to come use their platform because they don't have to respond to court subpoenas because of where their servers are located and they don't store any data. Well, I think there's far more culpability there than just recklessness. We just need to... I appreciate it, thank you. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fluger. Thank you, Madam Chair, and you know, to all of you, thank you for <clears throat> not only being here, but for the effort that you put in, and sorry that a few of us had to step out and come back, uh, so I hope we didn't miss you know, some of the questions we're gonna, gonna ask. Uh, Ms. Neville, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. I appreciate the fact that you're here. I have a 15, 12, and seven-year-old daughter, daughters, all three, and you know, like was already mentioned by my colleague, Mr. Griffith, you know, I've already texted my wife and talking about what we can do. We have a youth summit coming up and this is gonna be front and center. And unfortunately this continues, to, we, we continue to have meetings like this where there's so much, I, I would say avoidable tragedy. Um, forgive me if some of these questions have been asked, but it seems like the, and this is for anybody on the, on the panel here, it seems like the, you know, one of the cruxes of the situation is how do you, how do we wrestle with the privacy issues? You know, these, I'm former military, so the end, end encryption and the disappearing messages and the fact that you can use pictures and all the things that, you know, that it should be considered as good, you know, when it comes to privacy are also friction points when it comes to my 15 year old daughter who um, is a minor and the predatory practices that we see, you know, throughout these platforms, so that that is one question, is just wrestling with that. How do we, you know, wrestle with it? And secondly, are the advertisers on these platforms, specifically Snapchat, is there a way that we leverage them as part of the solution? I've heard a lot of different ideas, but I'll let you guys talk on, on these ideas and, and, you know, where we go about it. Thank you. You know, I think one thing that we have to kind of um, think about is that we don't have to look at privacy and safety as polar opposites. Um, there's so much discussion about, you know, privacy from, from the government, overreach from the government. When it comes to harmed people, though, and, and holding companies liable, it's not the government that's seeking information. It's, it's individuals who, who've been irreparably harmed on the, on the platforms and who, who really have a right to the information just through the, the ordinary discovery processes of court. Um, and to actually require that the, the companies hand over that material of, of, of harms and, and crimes um, actually encourages safety. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I think that's what, you know, the accountability of having these executives do what they said they would do and the policies that you know, I read through Ms. Neville's um, binder there earlier um, and, and actually having them be responsive you know, to the inquiries. So, I, and, and I'd like to add, so there, you know, we talk about privacy. There's a difference between privacy and data destruction. And I'll give you an example. In the Snapchat app, there, app there's a feature called My Eyes Only. Um, this is a, a data vault where you can save all sorts of data. You have a pin that even Snap doesn't have. So it says if you lose that pin, the data is gone. Most parents don't know this exists. Um, and, you know, it's the equivalent, imagine a corporation that has a shredding room somewhere in the back. And if you don't know the pin to get in that room, it automatically shreds all of the company's data. That is what Snapchat has in its app, um, which it is providing to children, eight years old, 10 years old, 
Um, and so when we talk about privacy, again, it's, it's important that we clarify how much of this is privacy and how much of it is destruction. Um, companies keep sensitive data all the time. Banks keep sensitive data and they keep them private. But in the event of a law enforcement necessity, we have a system that provides that there are certain circumstances where law enforcement has a right to that data. So, so I would argue it's not a privacy issue at all. It's a profit issue. L let me follow up with this. On Snapchat, on the platform, and I think this is one of the problems in Congress writ large, Ms. Kamek and myself and maybe a few others are probably the youngest members on this committee. And this is one of the issues of not being familiar as a legislative body necessarily with the functionality. But on Snapchat, the messages are encrypted, they disappear, they go away, but is, do you have to have a, an acceptance of the person that's sending that to you? And is the acceptance then, are we keeping those records of who those contacts? And, and, and I'm not sure if I'm understanding the acceptance. So I mean, the people send snaps, complete strangers will send snaps to children with explicit material. Um, and when those children click on it, the material pops up. Um, there are instances now, I, I think SNAP uh, instituted this sort of monitoring uh, a tool of some sort um, in 2022. SNAP also, by the way, in, in June or July of 2022, um, put its product out onto a web browser. So you children no longer even need the app to access Snapchat, uh, which makes it harder. But, but my point there is you only have that ability to see who's communicating, not the content, and you only have that ability if you know that your child is using Snapchat. Mm -hmm. I know I my time's expired. I know, can I make one, I wanna make one point though. Uh, you mentioned the advertising, and I'm 100% with you. I've been working with somebody who is keeping a database of, uh, a, like, say, Disney ad here, pill ad here, and that is the next level our advocacy is going after those advertisers. Please don't stop. Keep up your efforts. This is extremely helpful, um, and we appreciate it. I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman's time has expired. This time I would like to recognize myself, the gentlelady from Florida, for five minutes. Uh, I, I approach this in two ways. Uh, as kind of the baby of the group, uh, the millennial uh, here on, on the committee, but also as the wife of a first responder, my husband is a SWAT medic, a firefighter medic, and actually I was texting him and I said, uh, you know, did you have an overdose yesterday? And he said, yes, squad three had an overdose. And he's working in overtime today and he's on squad three and he says, inevitably, without fail, you can put money on it, we will have an overdose today. Um, as someone who has um, been married to a first responder who sees this, I think one of the, one of the elements that's been kind of left out today is the first responder. I know LEOs, you guys do a tremendous job and there's um, so many, resources that are out there for other things except for this, you know, and I feel like sometimes with the Narcan issue, we, we continue to push Narcan as a Band-Aid and it does save lives. Without a doubt, it does save lives, but I think we're, we need to do far more than continue to push Narcan because we are now seeing, and, and Sheriff, I'm sure you could probably talk, speak to this, we're now seeing Narcan parties. Um, where people will go and they'll buy the Narcan from CVS or from they'll get them from the public spaces that LEOs and, and our first responders place them in public restrooms and then they'll have Narcan parties to see how far they can push that high. Um, so that's a real, a real issue. Sheriff, I'd like to uh, pose this question to you about resources. I know a few, um, I think Representative Duncan asked about grants. Particularly with, with you guys, is there a grant that you can use perhaps like a, a COPS grant to have specific training done for your techs? Is there anything in this space that is specific to combating the fentanyl poisonings that we have and the tech element? So for the tech element, um, absolutely. I think, um, I, don't, I am unaware of any grant through the COPS office or through uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance that would specifically provide funding for uh, employees with the expertise to monitor social media. Um, honestly, that is how I ended up, you know, hiring and employing seven investigative analysts who are civilians uh, because they had the expertise. I didn't have the time or ability to train my commission law enforcement people to do it. So I think uh, a grant like that, particularly in some smaller communities, that could be a very effective way to allow law enforcement to get on top of this problem if we can resolve some of these issues at the tech end. 
May I add, it's not just the physical risk to our the people on the front lines, right? Mm -hmm. There is a real mental health issue here. Yes. Um, and I know just receiving calls, speaking to parents, it takes a toll. I cannot imagine what many of these first responders are going through having to walk into homes every single day to find dead children. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, the, the mental health and PTSD issues within our first responder community is a huge issue. Um, but since my time is limited, I want to try to get into some other issues. Um, we talk about Snapchat extensively here today. Obviously, Snapchat is hosted on uh, either the Apple Store or Google Play. Is there any issue within the terms of service because these apps have to be hosted on these platforms? And that's a whole nother issue in itself. But is there a terms of service that we can put pressure on, say, the Google Android uh, side of is issue or Apple, per se, to force them to say, if this app is not complying with XYZ, we will deplatform you? Well, so Google and Apple both say that they don't, they can have terms of service, but they have no obligation to actually abide by them. They'll still say that, that they're just a, um, an online marketplace. Um, but interestingly, when we were preparing our, um, our legal complaint, against Snap, we realized that the Apple Store says that Snap users can be as young as 12. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, which even Snap says that, it, that users have to be 13. And also, you raise such a great point because Apple and Google have so much user information. So they know how old a user is. Mm -hmm. That same user can go install Snap and lie about their age. There is so much here that I feel like we don't even, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. Geofencing, we talked a lot about the advertisement. I know that there was a judge in Virginia that rejected uh, a warrant that was using the geofencing advertising um, scope as, as a means to get that information. I don't think I've heard anybody talk about geofencing yet today, and I think that would be a huge part of the way that people can be targeted, particularly with Snapchat. And then um, another issue, and I know I'm running short on to act, well, my time has expired, but um, metaverse. Um, we are now seeing uh, the, the dope wars um, where they're talking about crypto highs in the metaverse. And now we are seeing where people are able to go buy drugs in the metaverse and then they are delivered to their home. Um, I think that's the next generation of, of where we're gonna see this issue going. Um, so um, I know you, I, my time's expired, so we can't really talk about that, but. Um, just thoughts, and we can talk afterwards, but thank you. My time has expired at this time. The gentleman from California, Representative Ogrenolte, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for everyone for being here on this really important topic. Uh, I'll tell you, the most difficult day that I've had in 18 years of public service has been last year when I had to console a constituent who lost both of her sons in the same day to uh, fentanyl poisoning. And as a father of two boys myself, I can't imagine what that feels like. So it's a really important issue. Uh, I wanna talk about something that Sheriff Knowles was mentioning, which was the incident in San Bernardino a few years ago. Uh, that, I think, really has a lot of parallels to what we're discussing this afternoon. Uh, I was, uh, part of my district is San Bernardino, so uh, it's, it's a, something I was right in the middle of, and I served uh, in the state legislature at the time on the Con Committee for Consumer and Privacy, uh, con Privacy and Consumer Protection. So we had a series of hearings on this exact topic, like where do you set this interface between people's desire for privacy and protection of their online data against, how do you balance that against our, our need to get access to that data with appropriate warrants for the purposes of enforcing our laws? Uh, so my question is, and I'm gonna pick on you, Ms. Marquez Garrett, because uh, I think you probably have some thoughts on this. Uh, is this whole thing a fool's errand? Because one of the things we found in our hearings, uh, you know, you can, you can go to the extreme and say, well, we should require all tech companies to build in a back door, door for law enforcement that they can get access to people's data. And I would hope that everyone in this room would be pretty horrified at the thought that government, you know, could have access to any data that you have on, online, right? So there's somewhere between, these, there's gotta be a, uh, you know, a, a, a balancing point. Uh, the problem is, as we enforce more requirements on these tech companies and give them more responsibility for trying to enforce the law, uh, aren't we just then inconveniencing the legitimate users of the technology 
well, we are incentivizing the illegitimate users, the bad actors, the, the people that are trying to deal fentanyl to our kids, aren't we just forcing them to go use a different platform? Because, I mean, the technology is there, as you mentioned, end-to-end -end encryption combined with, uh, combined with a, a, a policy that doesn't keep data, right? Uh, the, the, the tools are there that these platforms will always exist. And, I mean, I, let me assert that the reasons that our kids go on these platforms is because that's what the drug dealers are using, and the, the reason the drug dealers are using them is because they can use them to avoid getting caught. So it seems to me like we're this catch-22 where we can, we can propose all of these new regulations, but the only people that's going to hurt and inconvenience are the people that are legitimate users of the technology. It, it, would you agree with that, or, or am, I, am I off base on so that? So there will never be a 100% solution, right? We will never be able to save every child. We will never be able to catch every drug dealer. Um, but, but there's more that can be done here. And, and I'll, I'll go sort of backwards. You mentioned different platforms. I will tell you that often when we talk to children who've survived fentanyl overdoses, children who use SNAP, uh, when we've learned more about certain dealers, many of these dealers, many of these children would not use a different app. Um, and, you know, we have dealers who are exclusive to Snapchat, and it's known in the community this is a Snapchat-only dealer because they don't want to go to jail for the rest of their lives when a child dies. The, the other issue I would bring, you know, not so much the, the back door, certainly retaining certain amounts of data, um, but it, so at SMVLC, we work primarily with children. Uh, most of our families, the harms that have been caused are minors. Um, and, and so when we talk about privacy, these companies have no age gating and no incentives to make sure that they don't even have the opt out or the 1-800 number to make sure that they're not letting children on. Um, and I think when we, when we consider privacy in the context of an eight-year-old, or a 10-year-old, or a 12, even a 16-year-old. Um, you know, someone mentioned earlier about privacy, but when I was young and I had friends over, my door had to stay open. These companies are effectively saying that door stays shut, it stays locked, and even if your eight-year-old child dies, you don't get to know what happened. So, uh, uh, thank you for the, the answer. I mean, that, that actually is very helpful. Uh, I'm gonna push back gently on the assertion that kids if it's not on Snapchat, they're not going to do it. I've had two teenage boys. Uh, I think you're wrong about that. And, and uh, I, I agree. And, and not I will, I'm going to tell you okay. just from my own experience with Alexander, Alex was a big chicken. Graffiti showed up in the neighborhood, and he was like, oh, my gosh, what, we're in a bad neighborhood all of a sudden. If it was pushed back into the darkness like it used to be, he would not have gone there. It is. It was not his nature to go into scary places. The fact that Snapchat brings it into the light is very normalized. It helped encourage him to go down that path. That's a good point. Um, let me, I see my time's expiring. Let me just close with this, uh, because I'm going to push back on something else that you said, which is that companies aren't incentivized to stop this behavior. And I think that is 100% absolutely wrong. Having gone through this incident with San Bernardino, I can tell you, uh, Apple was horrified that their product was used in the commission of a crime this way. And uh, they were caught in a catch-22 where on the one hand, uh, th they comply with millions of, of subpoena requests from law enforcement a year. You know, on the other hand, they physically didn't have the ability to decrypt these devices. And what they were being asked to do, which is to open the code to allow experts to use the vulnerabilities to attack their own products, you know, would have affected millions and millions of legitimate users' privacy in addition to trying to deter, you know, these narrow sections of crimes from being committed. So it was far from a simple scenario for them, and they absolutely did not want to be in the middle of it. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's important that we, uh, we don't vilify the tech companies you know, because it, they're in a very complicated position that way. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that we can solve, find a solution that, that balances these priorities because I never want to have that conversation again with a constituent. That was one of the most warm, moment, horrible moments of my life, and I can't even compare my horror <clears throat> with what she was going through that day. So uh, I, I want to thank you for sharing your experience and uh, the experiences here today, and uh, let, let's keep working on this problem because it needs to be fixed. Thank you, the gentleman's time has expired. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation today. To our members, thank you. To all of our panelists, thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing your experiences. Staff, thank you guys so much for all your hard work and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. You sure can. <laughs>